So they'll work on the legislature to get, you know, to see if they can make some changes there. But in the meantime, we'll have to put in waivers and uh, do just do a lot of paperwork. Can I just add, well, I have the mic if you don't mind too. I, I really want to also emphasize, I, we're a pre-K through 12 plus school district. And one of the issues that I think we've really, it's been an oversight for us for a long time is really an emphasis to give preschool teachers the resources that they need. And so we sat down at the beginning of this year, started talking a lot about preschool. And uh, Kim, I know you can probably speak to that. The other thing I'll just mention um, is 12 plus or 18 to 22. We've never really had um, resources and materials for that program. They go out in the community, they do a lot of uh, job ready and do fantastic, um, but they should be having that training in the curriculum component. Um, in when they're in our building, which is the Millbake building, that little tiny house that sits in front of JC. And we've really never invested in that program. And so they're doing some phenomenal work there this year um, and trying to really make sure um, all the way through the pre-K through 12 plus, we're very focused. I don't know if you wanna mention some of the stuff you're looking at with pre-K. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, Kara's not here because um, Kara and Tony and Stacy and all of us, we had a conversation at the beginning of the year when, when we, talked about this opportunity to really have pre-K build up and help support. We have robust preschool classes that people value in our community and there's a wait list and they can't wait to get in. One of the things that we noticed was we don't have any systematic curriculum. And one of the easy lifts that we, we thought of right away was that we have, we've done this rollout for K through uh, three in foundations, but they have a pre-K component. So Tony was, Dr. Jones was so, um, you know, accepting and, and um, excited about that prospect. And I think that's, that's in the works, correct? Yeah, so we'll have a nice through line um, that'll give a nice fun foundation for foundations in kindergarten. So the kids that are with us, that will be exciting. And, and Kara and I will work together today, uh, this year to um, kind of talk about literacy from pre-K up. Sorry, Ms. Costin gets to trouble you. Ms. Costin. Sorry to keep asking questions from afar. Um, one of, since we brought up preschool, um, I think one of the problems that we see at some of our Title I schools is there is no universal pre-K um, across the board for Title I students and what becomes an access to pre-K gap then later becomes an achievement gap because they don't have that early foundation at school and, and all of a sudden, you know, they show up in a kindergarten class where other kids are writing their names and have that, um, that experience in an academic setting, which they've never encountered before. And I, I know it's not free, um, but I, I think it's something that we should really be thinking hard about if we're going to address um, the achievement gap early because access to pre-K and the, that early learning foundation is really critical. Sorry. No, actually, I know that's something this board has talked about year in and, and year out. And I think well before I was even on the board, I remember the state was at some point going to mandate uh, pre-K uh, and then it sort of frittered away. I don't know whatever happened to it, but it, 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 didn't, it didn't come into play, but I completely agree with you, Ms. Costin. Um, and one of the points I was actually gonna ask about, because I didn't see it on the curriculum management plan was preschool. And I hadn't thought about it much until I got a phone call from someone who's looking to move into the district who is asking me very specific questions about preschool and the preschool curriculum and you know, if they were moving their student here. And I had to say, I can tell you about our preschool program, but I can't speak to the preschool curriculum because I don't, I never had a child in the preschool program. And to be fair, I hadn't seen a curriculum. And so I, it got me thinking when I was looking at this, uh, it was a question I was gonna ask if that was something that we were going to be looking at as well at some point, just because you know, we're, we are, we, we've added to preschool, there's more need than ever. Um, and, you know, that, that program is growing rapidly. Oh, just, just a question. Dr. Jones reminds me often that she was a kindergarten teacher and she sees everything through the lens of a kindergarten teacher. 
Um, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how, how important we feel it is to, to, to make it a more um, standardized approach to our preschool um, learning plan, because I will tell you as a principal of, for 15 years, it always amazed me when we had kindergarten orientation and the little guys came in and we did informal screenings on them, the vast disparity in what they knew. And it was very dependent on the location. Um, and that puts kindergarten teachers in a difficult position on the first day of school. And you then throw in the age discrepancy uh, in Connecticut, which can be four and a half all the way to six. Mm -hmm. And so right from, right from the start, you're putting us in, in a very precarious situation and asking us to close gaps that have emerged before we even had an opportunity to teach them. I'm um, just to that kind of following up on that. I know we were talking about with the math interventionists screening all of our kindergartners do we do the same thing with our literacy specialists or we don't have enough staff for that you know it just would seem like a good idea so we have a couple on kind of piggybacking on on their great idea we have three schools this year that kind of tried something a little bit different and they took some phonemic awareness um, tasks out of Hegarty letters and sounds um, and some really pre-reading skills that we would expect them to come in to kindergarten knowing, again, to kind of get a, um, an idea of where they're at. Um, so we have three schools that did that this year. The data is just coming in. I'm excited to kind of work with those principals to kind of see what they found, if they found it valuable. We do have a universal screener that is just a unit. We have STAR that, that will assess risk. But the exciting thing that I'm looking forward to is um, Another thing from the state that came is that, is that STAR, as we talked about at the last retreat, um, is no longer approved. So we have an opportunity to pick a real, uh, a universal screener to Mike's point that um, will let us really dig deep into discrete skills. And when I look at the options here, there are some options that I think once we get a committee together to look at and look through, will really allow us to pinpoint areas that will do a nice through line into intervention and we can catch that early and get us into some tier one intervention with our classroom teachers so they know they can use the data to inform their small group or their whole class instruction depending and then our our literacy specialists can also use that data to to pick an intervention that will match the student right now our literacy specialists are are amazing and they're doing um we we use um we use the core as a, as a universal kind of screen when a kid comes to us, there's different components, there's phonics, phonemic awareness, comprehension, um, vocabulary, there's all different subtests that we can kind of dig in, pick a targeted goal based on, you know, what they need and then provide intervention um, with, um, you know, evidence-based materials. I, I also think we can do a little bit of better job with our outreach to our existing uh, preschool partners and letting them know what our expectations are now, obviously, they all have different philosophical approaches to preschool, and I respect them all. Um, but I think if they knew um, kind of what we think on a fundamental level, we'd like to see uh, our youngest learners coming equipped with, it would certainly um, be advantageous for us. Well, I was going to take the leap from preschool all the way forward um, with a with a tiny little stop in between. I know. Uh, Ms. O'Regan and I have had this discussion many a time too, is the testing that we give our students. I mean, I, and you brought up something which just jogged my thoughts, which is we give these students standardized tests. It happens in SATs, it happens in our SBAs. And you have a student who's never had an experience or asked a question that they then have to interpret with a basis of having no basis of knowledge, right? If a student's asked, if you go to the bowling alley with your friends and you only have enough money for two pairs of shoes in one alley with six pins, blah, 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 and the kids don't know what that means, then they're already behind in trying to answer that question. So have we ever had the opportunity to see what, you know, to look at, into that, to see if, you know, we've talked about giving students tests in their native language, especially at younger ages or other questions in the past, but have we ever looked into seeing what questions are being asked to, so that these students, we know that they're, they have the core knowledge to answer the question. They may know the information, but they may not be able to, uh, you know, understand the question based on what, what's, you know, what is being asked of them. 
So, so I think Jeffrey has been been waiting patiently to jump in here, and 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 it kind of connects to what you were talking about earlier, Joe, with diversity, equity, inclusion, being culturally responsive, having a culturally responsive curriculum. So, Jeffrey, I'll let you. Um, so our ESL teachers, and, and that is what Kim and I were talking about, that is a large portion of what they do in pre-reading and looking at academic vocabulary and giving students the access to things that they may not have experienced or are just not culturally, um, are not cultural experiences that they have had. So that is a, a big portion of what happens in an ELL classroom. Um, is pre-reading and exposing students and teaching students so when they see those questions or they read that book, they have that experience. But I think that's something universally that programs are looking at. Is this question something that is accessible to all students? Because if you look at something even like the SAT, students take that around the world. So when they look at those questions, is it something that a student in Spain or France would be able to access and are they able to show what they know or are they being asked a cultural question with a side of um, academics? You said it so much better. <laughs> but um, I, I was just gonna jump forward because we were talking about the supports at the younger ages. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about something with the supports for the older uh, grades. And I know in the presentation, I had asked this before you said you were gonna look into it. You, you noted that the ninth and 10th graders are gonna be taking the PSAT shortly. It's also offered to 11th graders, but I don't, it's not required for the 11th graders to take the PSAT. Um, and you said the teachers were gonna be looking through the results from the ninth and 10th grade to see what supports they might uh, need to be able to put into place. Um, to get them where they need to be. And you were talking about before and after school help and something called the uh, SAT Academy, which I have to say, is, I love the idea. People say things are test optional when they're going off to college, but they're not so much, they're moving backwards. But um, it's a wonderful support for students, but I'm wondering why that SAT Academy is not necessarily being offered to 11th graders. And if that pres if those benchmark, benchmark tests uh, in language arts that were given to the ninth and 10th graders, were they also given to the 11th graders as well? Because that's a grade that's sort of fallen a little bit through the cracks and, you know, everything's being put in place up, up before and after them. And they're, they're at the crux right now. So I just want to want to make sure that we're, you know. So I'm not sure if Miss Barry is on tonight. I sent that question to her to see if she could clarify it for us. I know that for the ninth and 10th graders, what they do, oh, then you may take over, Ms. Barry. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm here. Yes, um, good evening. The ninth and 10th graders do take a benchmark um, that is from released sections of previous PSATs. Then teachers look, we run those through, teachers look at the results and then they discuss their students um, and the PLCs and follow up in PLCs. Um, that's even before the whole ninth grade takes the practice PSAT and then the 10th grade takes it. So we have those results also in Link It from the full ninth grade, full 10th grade. So by the time the kids are in 11th grade, they have in Link It ninth and 10th grade scores. We have the previous benchmarks and teachers continue to practice using, you know, um, SAT, um, prefixes in their questions and align type of questions. And the SAT Academy is, is also, is for 11th graders and we offer after school SAT um, workshops as well. That's through the continuing ed. So there are opportunities in 11th grade as well. Well, that's really good to know. And hopefully maybe, maybe that's something we can also share out with the high school parents. Cause I, I know it used to be, the, there used to be an SAT course offered uh, like a, over the summer that I didn't see in this year's summer school program. Um, but, you know, I, I, students are definitely moving back towards taking a lot of these standardized tests for college entrance. And since one of our strategic goals is, you know, 100% graduation rate, we also want to make sure that they're graduating and that they have the next step, whether it's school or something else. And that, that's a good way for those who want to continue their education to, to take that step. And we'd like an objective measure and an objective benchmark. And we, last year's ninth graders 
pre and post really showed some nice growth in, in the aggregate. And we're hoping that that will result in higher scores as they move along. We'll see them again in this year, 10th grade, as we track that progress. But, um, you know, COVID, we had some dip post COVID and it's, it's in endurance. And we're trying to build that back up in a number of ways. And if you look at one of the slides, the, where they struggled was um, in sort of the evidence-based stuff, recognizing powerful evidence. And that's what we're trying to target and hit this year. Thanks. I just know, like I said, I, I talk about a specific grade because during COVID, you know, the, the high school was their hybrid and they didn't, ha they had a whole year and a half or plus without midterms and finals. And so some of these students are coming in at the later grades in high school, having to take their a midterm or a final for the first time. And that can really positively or negatively impact uh, uh, their GPA overall. And, and they have very little time in the later grades to, to make that, that up. So that's why I, I focus in that area, so. Okay, um, I wanna jump to the high school, but real fast, do you wanna make like a two seconds on NGSS? Cause it's hard not to skip it. I mean, it's a real robust. Um, we are doing well in NGSS. I think you can see from the scores that we're feeling confident about the growth we continue to make. We attribute that to our digital partners in Tuva and Explore Learning, their test-like simulation software that we have. Um, implemented for the last three to five years, depending on the program, and, and we like our results there. The only note I would make about the very minor regression in our 11th grade data is that that cohort of 11th graders is the same cohort that you'll see in eighth grade in the 2019 data. So what you're actually seeing is a 12-point jump from the last time they were tested in eighth grade. And if we remember that 11th grade cohort, they, their three years of high school have been under some sort of COVID limitation, which you can imagine affects the science classroom quite a bit when it comes to hands-on material-based lab activities. That is a very good point. Now I'm very happy I asked you that. Still very impressive. Okay, go ahead. So on, so on science, the, um, because I know our, our, our magnet school there is, is it, our science elementary magnet school or STEM magnet school side obviously underperforming the um, 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 so on page 32, the, um, the, the gap significant. So um, um, I'm, I'm assuming this has been the topic of a lot of conversations. It's full steam ahead, so to speak. And, and it's, it, dun, dun, dun. I feel that from Mark, you mentioned it earlier, but um, it is full steam ahead and, and it is hands-on. It is co-planning with those teachers and saying what's happening in our classrooms. What are we able to implement with fidelity in the curriculum as written and where are we having content gaps in our teachers understanding or instructional gaps in how the units foundational units are to be implemented similar to as kim kind of just explained students with differing background experiences tend to perform poorly on our science assessment the science assessment um, uses what's referred to as novel phenomena to assess content and skill so we have no idea what's going to be tested on this assessment at any time. They can take assessment strands from K through five in four different disciplines of science, and we never know what that's going to be. So what we do is we give broad understandings of all the content necessary in our K through five foundational lessons, and we drill down to the skills. The skills in that test are often about decoding and reading comprehension of data. So that's what we have our, our partners in digital platforms to work with. And I have work to do at our Title I schools. I know that we're ready for it and we're attacking on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move to the high school. That's okay with everyone. So, um, I don't know, I was gonna jump into AP scores. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, I mean, first of all, I'll just take a step back. It's amazing that the number of tests that were given, the number of children that are taking AP exams and the success. I was trying to see if there was a correlation of any sort between the increase in certain subject areas and the scores and it. Not really, it sort of depends on the subject area even more or less. Um, but of course, what jumps out is, has why is social studies just generally, there's just more tests? There's more tests. Right. So, because I, I, I thought Lucy is on board too. She can answer those okay. questions. So for I feel like this is a dumb question, but so yeah. yes, have at it. Is she there? Out. 
There she is. We can't hear you. Mute. Good evening. Yes, in social studies, we have um, many AP courses offered, hence why we have so many students taking AP tests in that area. AP psychology also happens to be a very popular course um, where we have close to 300 students taking that course, um, which also leads to a very high number of AP test takers. Okay, I didn't realize that, thank you. Yes. Does anyone have specific questions on IP? It's not a specific question, it's an observation. I was really impressed that, you know, that last year's results, we had a lot of higher averages. I think that's, you know, the volume of tests is great, but what the, how the kids are doing on the test is, you know, arguably more important. And I know like it, it's definitely content, you know, it doesn't look like it, but it, if you look at the other chart, there was a link in there about what the averages were um, in 21 versus 22. And I know the tests have been a, in 20, they were a little weird. So it's, it's a weird year, but I think there were a lot of, a lot of classes had really impressive increases in what the average score was. So kudos to the, to the high school. Yeah. I mean, just, if you look at calculus AB and calculus BC, the number of children taking that and the average score is incredible. And then, um, the computer science too, to come back like it has in 2022 is just, I now understand why we're offering a class now beyond computer science AP. I mean, you know, a lot of people are talking about math and technology and right here, you're but I also think pretty you know, yeah, look at English literature, which is one of the harder classes, um, AP classes, which went up almost a full point from 3.45 to 4.37. So that's a big, you know, was, with 125 kids, 124 kids taking it. So that's to impressive. Take into account that we start later than the, the APs are based on the, like Southern school right. schedule. So we already are at a deficit late. in time right. going in because our schools start later. And then this year in particular, mm -hmm. we lost about, you know, what is it? Five to 10 days yeah. of instruction. So I was, the question I was gonna say is, I mean, there's certain things like that teachers will talk about this constantly that they can't get through all the material. They try their best, but it's even harder with things like, you know, United States, you know, history and government, because that is, a, it's linear. You can't really and jump snow around. Days. And so we had so many snow days. That was the only question I was going to point out is, or ask is, you know, at some point how we figure out how to support those students, because every single day that we had as a snow day, it, it impacts those particular courses so much more, I mean, not so much more, but it impacts them in a different way because they're tested in a much earlier date. They're, they're tested in early May. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, then we have no more way to build in there. Yeah, I noticed that one of the, um, at the open house, I learned just how quickly they were moving through the material. And um, and one of the, the math teacher actually made the comment that our, I guess the way our schedule is set up, that she only has, is it how many minutes? 50, help to block? 50. 254. And, and that, you know, other school systems, she, they're getting like a full on over an hour in math and how she's trying to move through a BC calculus course at that speed. Um, but then look, I mean, the results are pretty good. So I'm just, I'm very impressed. And, um, but I feel like we need to ask Laura Newell a question. Um, no, no, you can't get away without. So, I mean, it's harder for you because you don't have the same numbers of students taking a test, but what, what are you like most proud of here? There's, I mean, this art and design class seems pretty interesting. I think what I'm most proud of is in, on the art side is that we offer an option for students who aren't really into the hands-on art and we offer that art history. So even though there are a small amount of kids, even just, I went in the class last week, all of a sudden there's a bunch of kids who are taking our history. And that was one of our newer courses and it doesn't appeal to the typical studio student who will submit a portfolio and along those lines. So I think what I'm most proud of is that we have such a nice diverse offering that like if you're not the traditional, like even instrumentalist, you can take the music theory and the composition part. So the fact that we appeal to different types of students and we do see you know, students taking advantage of that I'm, that's what I'm really most proud of. 
And then I noticed that French had an uptick, right? In terms of, I think I heard that on the video, in terms of people taking the AP, is that right? I think it was French, okay. Um, as somebody new to the district, one of the things I'm so impressed with is the scores overall on the APs. And when I look at the amount of students that we have taking them, that's something that I'm really excited about for the future to have more of our students taking AP exams because they are doing so well. And I think that speaks volumes to the teaching that's going on at the high school and starting with our bus program all the way up. And just to reiterate, like the, the number of kids taking it, it really is amazing college prep because, you know, there are many students who say, you know, their time at Greenwich High School was harder than their freshman year of college, you know, so because of all these AP classes. So I, I, I think we are preparing our students who are highly motivated. Cody's more recently out of high school. Maybe he can speak to that a little more. <laughs> I will, I'll give a plug for the APs. I graduated college in three years because of all the AP credits. That's pretty But cool. I will say, I had Mr. Epstein for AP US history and he viewed anything lower than a four as an abject failure and measured against that. And so I'd, <laughs> looking at our scores, we have a lot of room to uh, improve. Although some of them are quite impressive, but. I was going to say, one of the things we do focus on so much are our AP, the number of students and the scores from the APs, but there are a lot of courses that don't have an AP component. We have a lot of honors programs and a lot of honors courses that are, they get the same credit for a lot of students opt to take honors uh, in a, over an AP if it's offered um, for multiple reasons, they may not be ready. And I know I had asked if we could sort of at some point going down the road in future, start to look at some of those honors courses as well. When we're looking at our, you know, not just at APs, obviously it's you know, easier to look at, but there's a huge component of our students are taking these very high level honors courses and uh, other honors options that, that we're not really seeing here and reflected here. And they're just as important as the APs because some of the students just, you know, they can't do the APs for multiple different reasons. So I just, I wanted to point that out. So I. Because I think it's a it's an important designation to, to have. We've already started on gathering that data for you. Thanks. Yes. I was I was going to say I was going to say something similar. You should always be concerned when you you're thinking like me, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, because I'm wondering about the metrics. Um, if there are other metrics, if we, with the, as, in regard to the AP, if we're um, keeping if we're counting the right way. If, this is fleshing out as much as we should. So I'm curious, for example, um, the numbers, the raw numbers are great. It'd be interesting to see what percent and track over time, what percentage of our students are graduating with AP credit, the, um, how that number changes um, and how many AP credits different students graduate, like how many students are leaving with four, how many- right, Like how many tests they've, tests they've passed, exactly. right? You said, you know, yeah. As they graduate, that's that would be good data. I think that might be, yeah. As far as that, that these numbers are great, but the, I don't know if they tell the whole story. Much like tracking the honors, and they help <laughs> already. <laughs> Point show. Um, yes, yes, they do. It's very expensive. The tests are very expensive. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, they're like ninety dollars a test. No, we do for, for students with needs, but overall, we couldn't afford to spend to, to pay for every single over one 100 bucks each. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I sense we're moving on, but I don't want to move on without knowing why what Mr. Healy has to share with me and what Bonnie has to share with me. Can, can I offer that Mr. Healy would be able to provide wonderful context to our school improvement plan conversation that's coming up? Not to put, not to put him on the spot. Okay, but then when we get there. And so Bonnie, do you, you're the only one I haven't really heard from, so on this panel. She's saving up for the October 20th meeting where we're all gonna just let her do the whole thing. Herself. Well, but it's funny. I mean, Alp leads to a lot of this AP, I would hope, and we've always asked for that, so. I would say not just Alp. I would say going back to our curriculum management plan for us to get these types of scores 
it has to start in kindergarten and pre-K and what we do to for the achievement for all of our students from a very young age all the way through. We need to be celebrating that with our kindergarten teachers. These AP scores are not possible without that strong foundation we build in the elementary school and making sure that we are pushing those kids as far as we can. That's a very good way to end. Okay, so yes, thank you. Um, so can we go to the school? Oh, sorry. Oh, no. Was that still? We did that at the last meeting. Okay. So let's go to the update on school improvement plan. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Cody. Just one thing that just dawned on me is a potential way to evaluate um, what the opportunity is, is we do everything on an aggregate basis with schools. I would be very curious to see how the test scores break down. It can be anonymized, but by teacher, especially when they're in elementary school and you have different um, teachers per grade, because it's kind of gives you a controlled variable, just you have random classes assigned with different teachers. And what you could extract from that is where kind of the ceiling is, right? If you have could be the case that it's all pretty close, but I'd imagine that there's some classes maybe where you have outperformance and that could be a very good guidance on what is achievable and you know where how much of a spread there is between where we're at and where we could go, just as in this improving the quality of data so we can actually discern things from it idea. I was just gonna, I, have no, I don't have any other questions. I know all of you guys have worked so hard and I just wanted to just add an extra thank you because I, this is one of the, the best conversations I feel like we've had here in a long time and talking about a lot of these things. And to see all of the discussions that we've had over the past few years come together to this type of data retreat that we're talking about here and achievement and curriculum and coming up with school improvement plans because that's always my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> I'm just I'm just overwhelmed and I just wanted to say thank you to, to all of you, to, to our members who've been here for a long time and our newest. Um, I'm just very excited for the future. It's a good transition. School, yeah. oh, the high school. No, I forget the high school. And the high school. Oh yes, no, absolutely. I know that you were yeah, echoing. I, I acknowledge <laughs> um, Okay, so school improvement plans. Who is this? So first order of business is we need to stop calling it site improvement plans because school, <laughs> school improvement plans. Um, think of a school improvement plan and you have the template in front of you that we ask all of our building administrators to fill out. Think of them as the tributaries that lead to the larger river, which is our strategic plan. So flowery tonight. I just want to make sure I keep Joe's interest. Um, Every, every school, and I think let's start with um, when you'll be able to see these. So on October 17th, on October 17th they're due. Uh, the high school plan is due to Dr. Carabillo. The elementary and middle school plans are due to me. Um, most of them are already finished with their plans, but that date also coincides with when the building administrator's goals are due. Why is that? It's because there should be a direct through line between the teacher goals that are set the building administrators goals and the school improvement plan goals and they all lead into our strategic plan. So I think this is a wonderful opportunity for uh, Mr. Healy to have a little microphone time and talk a little bit about how he approaches the process at Central Middle School, if he wouldn't mind. Really an invitation? Or... <laughs> <laughs> what if I would? <laughs> Um, so I was not aware that this was going to be happening this evening, but I'm ready to fire away because this is actually one of the things that I enjoy doing in my job. Um, so um, as, as Mr. D'Amico said, um, you know, each year we go through the process of, of developing our school improvement plans at the, at the school level. Um, and while each of us has our own plan, it's a very collaborative process. So it starts, it does start from the top. So even all the discussions recently around this district strategic plan that's been coming through that the team has done such a great job putting together. Um, we've had lots of conversations about that document, the goals on that document over the years, 
um, and then really drilling down into what that means for each individual school using the same data points and the same targets and then the similar strategies. So um, I've had many meetings with many of the folks at that table already and will continue to all the way up until the, the 17th as well as with um, Mr. D'Amico and then my colleagues, um, Mr. Beinstein and Mr. Goldstein at the other middle schools, because we do actually work very closely in terms of aligning our, our strategic improvement plans or school improvement plans. So in essence, what you what you really see in, in that through line Mark is talking about is um, when we look at what the district priorities are and the district goals are. So for example, what are we looking at in that, that recent document for, for this coming year? Um, we then dive in with the help of Ms. Lau back there to get our data sets in front of us. Um, and develop our school-based goals aligned to those areas. So when we're looking oftentimes traditionally at our SBA, especially six through eight, all three grades where kids are taking the SBA, SBA uh, reading, um, SBA math, and GSS for eighth grade, um, those are our core target areas. Now we're really looking at uh, even that extra wonderful data set of growth targets um, and also the growth targets for both our high need students and our non high need students and how are we doing with those. So we at the school level tackle those um, conversations and discussions and then try to set our appropriate targets aggressively stretching right we got the message on the stretch goals and we're really focusing on those too right so the idea of following in line with those conversations to make sure our goals are stretch goals then from that once we're looking at our school-based goals we're having our individual conferences with every teacher to set their individual goals in their area now obviously our language arts and math teachers and science teachers it's much more straightforward because those students are taking the sba in those content areas um, it becomes a little bit more nuanced when you're talking about social studies, when you're talking about world language, but all of those areas obviously have standards, have assessments that we use. So the model themselves are the same. So then we sit down and we, we have those goals that teachers are setting with the kids that are in front of them that year. And based on where we are right now, we're not only using the data for where we got uh, in terms of their performance from last year on SBA or um, any of the benchmark assessments that we took, but we also have already taken the fall benchmarks in, in reading and math already. So we have that data and then we also have a, um, a fair amount of in-classroom data sets, whether we're looking at big ideas, tests and quizzes, for example, in math. We have many data points we can do. And then we sit down for those meetings and then we look at um, a fairly um, consistent structure across the teachers and across the content areas for the format. And what's been wonderful, even with this team is, you know, they're still fairly new. I look at them as fairly new, but um, they've jumped right in and rolled up their sleeves. So what's been wonderful is the building principals have had a chance to meet with the, the uh, coordinator team and really provide some of those templates and their expertise in the content area and with the assessments and say, what are reasonable targets and what are we looking at? So then those goals happen for the teachers on their level. And you see that direct link from the district strategic plan down to our school-based improvement plan to the individual teacher goals. And then what we're really also working to align are the strategies that we are using to meet those goals. What we've decided, we believe um, with our pedagogical knowledge, this is what's gonna get us there. And so um, we really work to look at the strategies that have been implemented. So simply speaking, again, when you're looking at big ideas or you're looking at the ELA reading or the social studies, implementing those lessons is supposed to result in, in what we're looking for in terms of student gains. And so we're making sure that those are relevant in our plans, which also include professional learning, right? How our teachers are spending their time outside of the classroom, improving their practice and building their capacity. Um, and then what's going on exactly in the classroom. So then when we go through and walk through, whether it's a group of the coordinators who come to the buildings or we do it in our own building base, we're actually seeing these plans in action. We are taking in that information and giving feedback to the teachers on um, their progress toward their goals periodically. And then of course we have the mid-year check-in to see where they are with their goals. And then obviously the end of year reflection. So it really is a very clean line from what the expectation is at the district level down to what we're doing at the schools, down to every individual teacher. Just something that I would add, uh from the elementary perspective is the 11 elementary principals have come together, worked with the coordinators and Ms. Lau to unpack the data at the elementary level as well. And one of the messages that we wanted to make sure our, our teachers heard loudly and clearly was, we aren't coming off our big ideas implementation initiative. Historically speaking in Greenwich, we would shift initiatives after one year of implementation. And we would never give teachers really an opportunity to master the, from, to a, a level of breadth and depth that we feel is appropriate 
for them to utilize new tools and resources. So we're signifying, we're signaling, we're staying the course for a second year because we know that next year we have to move on to reading. So you'll see a through line by and large in our elementary uh, school improvement plans that we're staying the course. Our academic focus is on mathematics, making sure that the teachers feel quite comfortable and confident in delivering the Big Ideas platform at a level that we feel is commensurate with, um, with the training that we've provided thus far. Yes, sir. Just a, as I know, SIP plans, I was on that fun committee too. Um, so this is just something for us to discuss for agenda planning. We haven't had um, uh, an update on, you know, the SIP goals. I know in the past we used to get the SIP, each school's SIP plan and then get an update at some point during the school year. I think the last time we got that, I had asked Tony, I think it was 2019, I'd reached out. And so I was like, that's the last time I remember seeing SIP goals and the update where schools were towards that for obvious reasons. So um, if we're going to be getting those in the traditional October timeframe, the, the, the plans, um, I was gonna say just for agenda planning down the future and to give a thought as to what timing might be good for us to get an update as to where people are or if we wanna just tie that into, you know, as a strategic plan update on goals, but it's just a discussion for a later point because I can say most people sitting here haven't, had the opportunity to have a SIP update. <laughs> a yeah, I think it's, there should probably be a, a, a further discussion on how you, how you would like us to report out district-wide the uh, overall success of our individual school improvement plans. But I just want to remind everyone that they will be posted once they're approved. So by the end of October, we'll probably set like a November 1st target date. And all principals will signal in their weekly message to parents that the school improvement plan has been posted. But every elementary principal has a responsibility to bring in their parent body and walk them school walk them through the results of last year's school improvement plan and how it leads into this year's school improvement plan. And they are all posted on every single school's main page. If anybody has interest in going back and looking through, because I have read all of them. <laughs> have you, Joe? <laughs> Um, okay, I think that's that's great. Yep, Michael Joseph. So let me just say because um, I heard a number of things there that I think are worth highlighting um, because I think they're all, they're all terrific. Uh, run one based on you know it's it's grounding all of this in real data and just in the performance of students and achievement in real time. Both been not only the data we just looked through, but the benchmarks from only you know this this fall. Um, it sounds like we're, we're, there's a laser like focus here on instruction. The, um, and very much um, we're talking about a level of organizational coherence that um, I think is um, um, is new to us in certain ways. The, um, that, that's really, really terrific because I'm weird. The, um, I've gone back and read many SIP plans over the years the, um, and many of them seem like they were written in past years, not this year. The, um, even like, many seem like they've been written in a vacuum. And what you're describing here was a process that's not, that's very much tied to um, both down to the teacher level and up all the way to the strategic plan and goals, not only this year, but out towards the future. And also very much tied to other aspects, the curriculum work, the teacher evaluation work that Ann talked about last time, all different aspects of, um, of the organization. And I think that kind of coherence um, is something we've been clearly been aspiring to for a while. And, and, it's, and it's important to highlight that. Well, it also creates a level of interdependency for our building administrators to learn from each other. So for example, we talked earlier about the success at New Lebanon School. The administration from New Lebanon School has the opportunity when coming together with the rest of the administrative team to talk about the strategies that they employed that led to those successes. Other administrators learn from their colleagues when you have those opportunities for those conversations. Anything else? No? Okay. Then I think we got to tackle capital. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I think they, um, everyone can go home, right? Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much.
Boy, was that great or what? Oh, uh, yes, Ready? That was off the cuff. There he is. Next time we'll see it. What? That's what we're doing. I'm just sitting here because I have to go. I think you should let all the students in the school system or the district college. Good. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, quite, join. Not quite big enough. I know. I know. <laughs> I had the one. It is. We're working on it. We're is working. On it. Uh, <laughs> you you wanted to say draft? It says draft. Perfect. <laughs> as big as we can make it. Yeah. We're working on making. Well, you saw the one that we had for the twentieth. We're bringing one of those for everyone to work on. You, I was gonna say, Dr. Jones has a uniform. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say, yeah, Tony has a neat uniform. Yeah, I do. Hello, Dan. And you know, usually when I enter a room at quarter after nine, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no hot mic moments. Okay, so we're moving to capital budget planning. Um, and for the whatever five people that are listening or whoever, I don't know, I'm just joking. Um, the your packet, just to be clear, this town, this is again earlier than historically, right? Meeting the town revised town process which again was apparently a decade old process, but okay, we're, we're becoming familiar with it. Um, and so it is a little fast and therefore we're only going to be having public comment on it when we meet and vote on this plan. So I am going to maybe if you could put in your Friday note um, to please encourage parents to maybe look at this document and then provide their thoughts because um, we'll certainly take a lot of public comment if they come on the 20th, but um, yeah, but emails and everything. Too, right? yeah, yeah, I just, I wanna make sure we get a lot of, a lot of feedback yeah. since there's a lot going on here. So um, with that, can I ask Ms. Downey cause I didn't get to go to the budget committee with a little bit of an update. Happy to. Um, so I've spoken to some of you. So the budget committee met uh, oh, low two, two days ago, and we focused our discussion on some of the major projects, kind of the big ones, um, including but not limited to Central Middle School, the Western Middle School Fields, Julian Curtis, Old Greenwich, um, and there was a discussion of Riverside as our next building in the food chain. Um, I'm going to not give you the deal, but basically all four of us participated. Blaze was there. Tony was there. I think it was a really productive discussion. Um, we got a couple different ideas on the direction we, we were thinking the board would want to go, given the four of us were there. So some of the documents were revised from the original posting to reflect those thoughts. They are not. Nothing is final until we vote on it on October 20th. But this was kind of the mood of the room, the consensus uh, of the direction we suggested that Blaze and Tony kind of revise the documents. So it, I just, just to, to the extent anyone says, well, you made changes and you didn't vote on it. Well, nothing has been voted on. So just to be very clear. Um, so I think I'm gonna turn it over to Blaze to give a little summary of what was changed based on our discussions. And it's, 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 it was a very free form discussion. Tonight's intended to be that way for those of you who weren't there. So to just ask questions and, you know, nothing's etched in stone, right? Yeah, no, not at all. Yeah, I think we had a really productive budget committee meeting and we got some really good feedback from the members and went through the main uh, drivers of cost. We had posted that really five projects um, for this year's request are driving, you know, over 87% of the request just in those five projects. Um, and then in the five-year window, we really had just a handful of, of really significant items that were really driving most and, and are, are forcing a lot of the conversation. So we tackled those head on. 
Um, and what is before you are a few things. And I'll, I guess, run through each of them and then we can talk about the, the main ones because they're pretty significant. Um, the first one is the thought process behind Central Middle School. It's highlighted because the number wasn't changed yet, but we, we all know at this point that after the pandemic, the number on square footage that was given was a, a little on the low side given the changes in the market. What the thought process here, and I'm working um, with the building committee on the time frame of when these numbers will be released, and if not, what we can do. But the architects um, were going to be required in the RFP to give their best estimate based on market conditions. Um, so each of those bids has a square foot price, um, all inclusive except FF and E, hopefully. Um, and hopefully we can talk to the building committee um, to see what their time frame is. And we'd like to basically take those eight square foot prices and take the average from those eight architect firms that bid. And I think that would give us a really solid number. And then we would consolidate in the uh, FF and E, which is around 5 million. And we, we hope to have this be to you, you know, in advance, you know, hopefully maybe next week. So it's well in advance of the 20th meeting and we can, we can get that information out there. And then that project also we know includes some field work. We don't know exactly what that will look like yet. No one does, but we know that it's on the table. So we had added something just so it was on the radar in 29 and we then moved it up to uh, 27 to line up with the construction. Yep. You know, just because we're talking about central, I want you, do you want to go through all of them or do you want to talk about like, cause Laura should fill us in on the committee. That's where she I was kind of yep. going. Yeah. So I didn't know. That's why I was really saying yep. while we're talking about central, let's there, talk about I'm central. Ready. <laughs> go ahead, Laura. Um, so the building committee has just also met this morning and we also met on Tuesday. Um, so we put out an RFP, we got, um, responses for an owner's rep some of the so we've narrowed it to three owner's reps um some have provided pricing some have not but obviously these are um calculations that have not taken into account um the soil testing which um is not or was not complete but i you know i know that the draft of the suitability, the soil suitability um, is hundreds of pages. Uh, Dan is probably sitting at that table and can maybe summarize that best because one of the questions was, well, how do we know what it's gonna cost if we don't know where we're gonna put it? Um, the RFP respondents for the architectural firms of which there are eight, I think Lays referenced the number eight, but maybe not um, in a way that's, we got eight respondents. Um, they sent in um, their proposals. Uh, the building committee is in the process of, you know, having picked those up over the last day or two, because um, it's a lot of materials and we have to read um, eight pricing proposals and sort of match those up with the reality of where the building might be placed. Um, hopefully all of them include, you know, not just an all in number, but also some of what they are calculating. Does it include site work? Does it include fields? When are they, when, you know, when might fields be completed? Because, you know, if we're handing over a building to the students and the administration and the teachers, you know, we sort of want them to know when they can utilize the, the campus as a whole. So all of these, um, all of these things, would it include landscaping, um, tree planting, fencing, you know, all of these things we want to be sure we're very thorough about and um, we should have a better picture um, within the time frame, hopefully, that will get us to the October 20th uh, time frame. So hopefully we'll have um, a more solid idea of what the real world current day pricing might be. I hope that helps. Yeah, I think that this way too, then, you know, no one knows what's going on with some of the market conditions, but I think at least logically, then we have a really defendable, you know, logic and number about how we got to that, you know, pricing per square foot. It's kind of the best way to go about it. I think at the moment with the limited information that we have, but the process that we have to follow. Um, 
the, the we gave it a thoughtful approach too when, when we went, given what's going to kind of happen with Central Middle School, um, the committee was then, uh, we were looking at the rest of the uh, pressures in the five-year plan. Um, the next major kind of topic on the 15-year plan would have been the Julius Cur Julian Curtis renovation. Um, this was, uh, yeah, I think, a project of significant um, you know, conversation over the last few years, especially through the last budget process. Um, that has been taken into account. The 15-year request that we have before you, we were looking at Dr. Jones, um, actually, you know, and, and Dan are out walking the facilities. They did all the facilities last week to kind of look at conditions and everything, met with the principal. Um, and so coming up with a kind of maybe a potential hybrid approach, we talked about this for a long time on Tuesday, um, where expansion, renovation versus doing some targeted needed renovations um, before you is um, a proposal that builds on the established logic that was kind of put together with the building committee um, for Julian Curtis, leveraging the um, ADA improvements, the elevator program, a couple of the, ba uh, two of the bathrooms, um, and then taking the design from the original ed specs, the thought process here, 800,024 instead, um, of design money to create an accessible front entrance. This would involve the two ramps that were proposed in the original design and the front, uh, as well as expanding the stepway a little bit to make room for wheelchair, electrifying the doors, um, and some other uh, minor details to be linked up with the security project that's going on there. Um, and then it would also include uh, 50,000 for design when Dr. Jones went to the school, we had the ed specs from some of the original information. She talked to the principal there. Um, what is the number one priority? The number one priority was the cafeteria, uh, clearly emphasized by the administration at the school. We um, were asked by the building committee to put together a comparison, for example, of which I'll pass around. Um, and. I, of the sizing for the cafeterias compared to the other elementary schools, just to kind of highlight the disparity. It, it is a really small room, basically. Um, it's only a thousand square feet. Um, so there's some idea to then in fiscal year 25, uh, put together a $2 million renovation package based on the design to expand the size of the cafeteria or do something creative um, that an architect can come up with with space at the school to find a, a better cafeteria solution there. And then in fiscal year 26, then go through after the cafeteria is done and, and do an, a re much needed renovation of the millwork fixtures and equipment. Um, this way we go through the, the most important needs, give that school and that community um, the, the most needed areas uh, based on conversation and our own you know, information that we have and still have a reasonable, tolerable, and logical financial model that we are proposing um, as a board. That that was the thought process there. Yep. Uh, two questions. We'll go back to uh, CMS for a second. Yep. I cruised out of there, and uh, there was a reference to the uh, soil evaluations. Dan, are we there yet? Or are we still passing on that? I will have a report in hand Monday. The uh, the engineering firm who was task with doing this has apologized up and down they had a COVID issue um still i'm still not 100 in belief of that but uh we just spoke with them we just spoke with them today and they promised that they would have us a full report on monday okay thank you second question is uh jc related it's a concern of mine of spending money well but there's also a urgency amongst our, our colleagues to get things done quickly. Uh, there are urgent matters of ADA compliance, which we all find, uh, we all support and all want to address it aggressively. So my question, Dan, and you're without all the research and work done, I just want your opinion because I know you know the, uh, you intimately know the building, you intimately know uh, the project, you int intimately know what we're talking about here. Uh, entryway sort of seems like it could be the entryway we were going to put in as far as the major project or major renovations we had talked about in the past, the $29 million renovation or so. So I could see that one being not putting good money at bad that you might have to rip out during a major renovation. So I think the entryway seems kind of cool. 
Uh, but my concerns are the uh, uh, cafeteria, elevator, and the, uh, the bathrooms. Now, if at one point it's decided, say, in the near future, uh, that a major renovation that we had talked about, it's, it's timely and it gets accelerated for whatever reason, uh, what are those things that we're looking to do uh, would be bad money at good. In other words, if we're putting an elevator in, uh, the elevator we're putting in, in a major renovation would be ripped out because of a redesign and, and would, be, uh, uh, would be put in a different way. Do we have a way of evaluating or understanding this, this, this short-term solution to JC's problems, which is in addressing the big scale issues we've talked about before? Uh, is there a way of evaluating the money we're putting into this in the short term? Um, push it or is it out? No, this one's out. Um, short term, Joe, it, you know, the crapshoot. We don't know what the design is going to be. The, the short term issue is the building is not ADA compliant. It needs an elevator. We've looked at several different locations, still haven't come up with an exact location. Uh, we looked at building an elevator on the outside of the building. Um, and we looked at elevator within the in you know the current layout of the building, which would be more costly. You'd have more infrastructure that has to be moved around. Uh, one of the ideas that it's still an idea is to add it in, in the uh, in the courtyard area right now behind uh, one of the classrooms. You know, accessing it, we might have to take some space out of a classroom. We don't know what we're going to do yet. But as far as a new design coming down the road. And, and elevator is a feature that I think they can design around. It's not like we're gonna be tearing down the building. Um, and it's such a large feature, such an integral feature. Um, yeah, I think we could build around it. Bathrooms, again, bathrooms are, they need to be upgraded now. We, they're not fully compliant. So depending on when the school is gonna be rebuilt or whatever, you have some time that we are in non-compliance. Uh, again, could be an item we worked around. I'm not sure. The bath, the, uh, the cafeteria, uh, cafeteria is a large component. Again, depending on where we put it, um, it could be part of the design to be built around. Um, the current idea is to enlarge the existing one. I don't think it's a bad idea. I, there's no plans. It's just an idea of where it goes. Uh, but that cafeteria is so small that the amount of waves that go through, I don't, I think there's five lunch waves, um, which is a, a little bit much for yeah, well, elementary four of school. my kids went through there, I do understand, yes. So, um, you know, it, it's, it, is there a definitive answer? No. Is something going to be touched in a major renovation? Probably. But I think if we get the right people if and when this comes along and we tell them, hey, we don't want you to touch this, we want you to work around it, they can do that. So there's, there's a chance, a good chance, of if we plan properly, uh, that some of the money we're putting into this thing in the short term to take care of the very, very needed issues, uh, that if we do have a major renovation in the future, if done properly, we could salvage some of that, uh, some of that uh, money we're putting into it now. I believe so, yes. Thank you. Before we move off JC. Yeah. I just had a quick question because I, I hate to, you know, poke a sleeping bear, but um, uh, we as a board had approved a <clears throat> school that was, uh, you know, not, not funded. Uh, and here I see that we've pulled back from that, but we as a board haven't discussed that. And, you know, I just, you know, I'm not sure. Does that mean that we're we're no longer looking towards what we uh, the ed specs and things that we approved? Are we pulling back because it's not a discussion we've sort of had as a board? I'm well, we're having it now, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, with I'm, no input. It's the first time I'm I've just, seen this. Uh, yeah. So I think at the moment I was just going to run through the changes from Tuesday, and then we'll probably go through each one and talk about them. Some of them are pretty significant. Uh, Julian Curtis is, is is a huge one. Um, or do you want to just talk about it now? Or do you want me to Would you guys prefer there? to hear the whole really comprehensive plan? Way. Yeah, let's let's finish the discussion. So, okay, so I'll, just, I'll run through quickly. We got back because we got we'll, off track. And yeah. then uh, we'll go back and, and go through each one in detail. Uh, the other major one, similar to Julian Curtis, um, in terms of the, the five-year model, what we were talking about um, at Riverside was realistic timing um, as well as realistic resource allocation. Um, the biggest one being 
thinking that it was essential to do uh, still to ask for the $150,000 to start the study at that location to see what the needs are, see what the infrastructure looks like. Um, and then one, one of the other things too, is to look at the resources and the ability to execute over the next five years. Um, and so the thought process here that we talked about was to adjust the scale of that potentially. Um, to One of the things Dr. Jones brought up a good point to the board that um, the way some of these things get framed to the community can be challenging because you put together a feasibility study, you get the whole community involved, everyone's pumped. They see that this is gonna be some $100 million or $30 million thing. Um, and then five years later, we're still kind of asking for the same funding for the same kind of project and everyone is in a bad place. So the thought process here was maybe to set some of the numbers a little bit more realistically in the model. That way, when you're putting together the um, committee to start with that feasibility study, people are starting from a framework that might set expectations for actually realistically accomplishing some of that work in the time frame that we're proposing. Um, and then Cardinal Field, the last uh, major change that we uh, have here proposed before you for discussion tonight would be, what are we going to do with the Cardinal Field uh, stadium project? Phase one is wrapped up. Um, there was one major uh, outstanding piece from phase one that was supposed to be completed in phase two. This is the planting and trees. Um, this is a directive from the tree warden. That's about $150,000. We talked about phase two of the project, which was uh, the, the small field house and a second stadium uh, or second set of bleachers, um, as well as the egress to the um, high school, the secondary egress um, and the bridge. Before you, um, proposal is to, to close out and, and get that we cannot get a certificate of occupancy from the building department until the tree warden uh, signs off on the planting plan. Um, so to do that, we need to finish the, the planting program. Um, and that's about $150,000. Um, and that and then we have the road, the thought process was to keep on the radar, see what things look like, um, push out a little bit um, in terms of prioritization and of our own ability to execute. Um, but keep some funding on there for the bridge and the egress. Um, and I had one more thing, which has come up since our meeting on Tuesday, which I'd like to add um, and or for add for discussion. Um, the GHS entryway building committee met this morning. Um, we had a very detailed conversation with the architect, um, the full committee. And basically, just to kind of drill down to the basics, you know, all the AE money that was allocated to the project has been expended. So now we have the 2.75, which is remaining. However, of the 2.75, our now new design process is eating into that money because there isn't any more money. In addition to that fact, any construction is gonna require a, at least a 10% contingency. Dan, I don't know if 20% is becoming with these projects, but I'm just saying 10, let's just say 10%. So if you take kind of the design money and a, 10, and a contingency, the 2.75 in construction is now not 2.75 in construction, it's 2.3. Um, well, I'm just, this is very back of the envelope. Um, so I think there is definitely a deep concern on the committee's part that given where the bids were and if we want to have something appropriate, whether it's going to be achievable with that number. So a thought um, I had, which I hadn't discussed with committee because it's not really the committee's decision, was to perhaps take that 10% number of the contingency and put it into next year's money because the project isn't going to start till June anyway. So if we don't get the money till fiscal year 24, um, otherwise, it would be the kind of thing that I think we as a board have to make a decision if the project comes back at 2.7, but now we don't have 2.7, are we going to go in and ask for an interim, but an alternative path would be to put a couple hundred thousand dollars, I, I just picked 10% off, really off the top of my head and I'm happy to discuss it, but put it into our capital request for next year now, and also realizing that before the RTM votes on this budget, we're going to know what the project costs. So it's really kind of a placeholder pending the construction. Uh, it, to me, it seems better than going in for an interim, given that we don't need the money. 
but town processes aren't always logical. But I, to me, that seemed that it might be the prudent thing for us to do for a board. I am picking a number out of thin air, so happy to discuss <laughs> um, with anyone what everyone's appetite is for secure, greater security at the high school, because we did not ask for any additional funds when we did our interim already at the high school in anticipation of this project. So I just wanted to alert everyone on the board that this is a possibility and just to, again, take the pulse of the room that if people say, let's put in some number for next year, then just op opening that for discussion as well. So those are the major projects and those really are um, in addition as a driver, but there's really nothing to do with this one. Um, it is what it is, is Western Middle School, uh, the field remediation. So those are the main drivers of, I mean, everything else really is about 16% of the whole cost. I mean, th those are actually 13% um, of the overall cost. So those were the major discussion items. Th that's what we spent a lot of time on with the budget committee. Um, and I think basically we just go through each one, the, the major ones for now, and then take other questions on the smaller stuff if there are ones. So... But point of order. So what we're looking at is this the this is the proposed capital budget. Is that what we're saying? Right. Yeah. So what you're looking at right now um, and the board operates a little bit differently than the rest of the, the town because this is a very public process. But the, there's just versions of but this would be the fiscal year 24, 15 year plan from the board that would be sent over. Um, Technically, for process, it gets sent over to the first selectman's office, who consolidates it into one capital budget. Um, they appropriate, just to be clear, only things in 24 have a project sheet and get an appropriation. The rest are just for the 15-year, you know, capital planning. So when we vote, when we vote next time, um, are we voting on, like, are we voting on 23-24? Are we voting on the 15-year plan? You would be voting it on your 15 year plan that includes your appropriations for 24. But we're not, you know, we're obviously not, we can adjust of any course. of those, but this is just more for the town's planning process for that, like by signaling, for example, the Julian Curtis and the Riverside, we're signaling that we're not going to be looking for 30 million for Riverside, we're going to be looking for 15. Which, which, no, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. The, um, the, the, the numbers are, are completely in the out years, these are all theoretical model, you know, just for planning purposes. By voting this year on, you know, $30,000 for kitchen equipment in 10 years, we're not saying that that's what we anticipate. The nice thing about having what the way when we have the 15 year model is most of it will kind of shift and then we add in the out year. Um, but the good thing is for the model too, is if something like Dan might open up a project and then find out that we've got to accelerate a project or push one out. And that's all a very acceptable part of the process. Um, Certainly more accurate than going back to the strategic plan. This would be, you know, it, it, they're all informed to one another. Um, so that would be kind of the process. Yeah. But you're not, but your real numbers for appropriation are your 24 numbers. And the town did ask the board, just as a reminder, um, instead of, you know, a 15 year plan, but really focusing on the five year in the guidelines, we're supposed to be getting um, a full a five year number for the whole town from the in, in the budget guidelines uh, for capital, rather than just the one year. And I guess the challenge is going to be just from things I'm hearing is like the town's going to give the or the BT is going to give a five-year capital number. I think the problem we're going to all find, us and the BT and their team, is this: the central number is going to throw all the math off. Um, that's could, not our concern. Could be twenty-five percent of the. Five it year could be twenty-five. Yeah. But project. again, that's not our job. <laughs> right. That's the BT's job. Right. Um, so the question is, how they choose to finance it is not our concern. We should right. ask for what we believe yes. we need, and let them figure it out. You know, everybody has their job, right? It's not our job to do the financing. It's our job to say, this is what we think we're going to need and let them say what's going to be funded. Yeah. And I, and I think this way we have, what, what we have put together as a team, I think we'll be going into it with a, you know, a logical approach that, that we took to doing this. May not work, but. Right. No, but it's certainly more reasonable. And you obviously did a lot of good work with the budget committee because 
They, they really did. I mean, we really had a really good conversation. Right. Yeah, wonderful. Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna jump into a few things, if that's okay. Okay, so straight to ADA compliance, I'm skipping. Wait, let's talk about, let's finish on the big projects first. I oh. would say, is everybody- Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think like, we might I guess wanna, I was gonna talk think, about it right now, but okay. Yeah, the biggest ones I think we, maybe we'll run big, through, because yeah. there, there might be a lot of conversation just on, um, maybe not as much on Central Middle School, but definitely I think on Julian Curtis, um, we should all be on the same page in Riverside. Um, and those are the most time sensitive. I think on the Riverside one, from. one of my thoughts would be, I'm not sure why we have a two-year gap between A&E and construction. Because we did it, I thought, we, I know we were shifting things around, um, but we kind of have a feasibility, then a year off, then A&E, and then two years off. And the problem is going to be with the state reimbursement process that we, if, then it's really going to be three years. Off. I, I think I would, I, we should, consider putting the 15 for Riverside in the fiscal year 28. I started with it with the, uh, in the sixth year, but. Cause uh, you were trying to hide it from the five. The fifth, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, yep. but, I, but I do think it's more accurate to say, you know, A&E you're off. Yeah. Cause kind of that's consistent with the way we've done our other projects. Just saying, I know. I don't know if anybody else's thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, you want to pick, I mean, you want to talk, do we want to talk to central middle? I mean, I don't have the number. I think Laura proposed, you know, kind of where the, a good thought process would be. We don't have the number yet, but we want to have it to you um, before the 20th so we can talk about it. But the logic there is to take the proposals, take the bids and take yeah. an average and add in the, the FF and E that we used. Yeah, I don't um, know how. And I think that's where we start and we, and we do it like the budget committee talked about. We got to do it the right way. If we're going to do it and, uh, that that seems like a defendable approach to, to making the number real. Yeah, and that's important, I, right? I was right. going to say because right right I think the budget committee felt that the 67, 69 is sixty-nine is two, and the, and the problem is you know we're then creating a whole false narrative. And the fact of the matter is whatever is appropriate. This is back to the state reimbursement process. The number that the RTM and the BET appropriate is the number that goes in for state reimbursement. Yes, you're only allowed one amendment. So you want your number to be as close to realistic as possible. So you don't want to be, you know, adding thirty million dollars. I don't think the state's going to look too kindly on us. No. Go ahead. I think one thing that we've had some pressure put on us about, and maybe even been criticized about, is the priorities. It's creating priorities. What I think we should do as a group, uh, if not this form, some other form of exercise, but basically we list the projects which we have and uh, respond back as a board uh, on what the priority uh, we think of that project. From that data we collect, if for example, we say Central Middle School on a scale of one to say five, five being the most important, we all rank Central Middle School, whatever number five to one or one to five, we decide to give it. And then the next projects in that way, then at least as a group, We've established the priority, so we at least work off of that, or another way of doing it. That's just a suggested way. But to sit here and sort of bounce it back and forth doesn't really create a priority that we can all sort of stick to and then express to the town or the BET or the community. But don't you think putting things in our budget for next year expresses those? I mean, we we certainly don't have just one priority, right? We can have multiple priorities. Yeah, I was, was going to say, the thing that I don't love about that, Joe, is that then very quickly people say, okay, thanks, I'm going to take your number one priority and cut the rest. I like the idea of this is, you know, 23, 24, this is our priority, right? And and that's like kind of your point, Christina. So, you know, if I were looking at this and we were voting on this, you know, we're sort of saying Central Middle School is our priority and is Western. I, my, and Old Greenwich. And Old Greenwich. One of the things, though, I, you know, we've talked about, and this was kind of the original problem with the 15 year plan was we were trying to smooth it out. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that goes to financing, frankly. I mean, there's lots of things that well, we're not going to get into long-term financing. That's the BET's decision, but you can smooth out capital by bonding or various <laughs> methodologies. But one of the things I look at is this is a, a pro forma. This is kind of a $41 million number. Right. If I take out Western and Central, ironically, I'm at 41. Right. And then that seems to be sort of the if going. You, can rate. I just say, if you take out of the 121 and almost 122 million dollars, if you pull out Central, Old Greenwich, the Western Fields, and the Ham Ave HBAC, 
HVAC, the four biggest projects, it leaves us with 12.9 million for right. all our buildings, for everything right. else. Right. To, to Blaze's point that that's, if that's 13%. Yeah, yeah. When we, when we put together the capital on that spreadsheet that came with the packet, the point was, is that Dan, um, I think, and, and Dr. Jones worked together a lot to, to do exactly what some of the things that we're talking about is to prioritize. And a lot of the routine maintenance, not to, I think, any major detriment at the moment, especially with all the grant funding that we got, but was, this is a small routine request. A uh, very small routine request. There's only a handful, and that was to help try to make room in the financial model for these major projects that were signaling our priority. Um, and we did defer to your point a pretty significant amount of routine capital. Well, and I think historically our our maintenance has been around 10, 11, 12 million, right? So then that's what you're. Or more. It, 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 you know, more based on the master facilities plan, it should have been. It should well, be it should much more. Uh, yeah, it should have been so we're, million, this is the maintenance third. number is very much in line um, with we've past been told years. We've been underfunding that for years. Yeah, but so so to that end, to that point, I think for all those reasons, I think we have to acknowledge that 23, 24 is not a normal year uh, because we've got this central middle school gorilla uh, in the budget. The um, and we, we, we have Western. that every year with some projects. Yeah, we know we've never had a middle school condemned. No, that's true. We but to, it, we're, we're looking at $80 million. Is, I mean, it's yeah, a, no, I'm just saying everything else is stacked up because it's been pushed down the pike. But, 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 but that still makes, that still makes this a very unique budget. And I think we need to, it would be, I think to Joe's point about priorities, the, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting we shortchange maintenance, but I do think um, it's appropriate that we, um, we we look at that and we do prioritize some things. I, I would argue it's not the year for some of these small projects such that as don't make, such, that, that aren't maintenance necessarily, such as the track, such as and maybe the HVAC, such as fences, such as playgrounds, as much as I love playgrounds, such as these, these unfortunately, the um some of these tough choices like that probably need to be made this year if we're really serious about getting you know these major projects done the um and some of the four hundred thousand dollar track that might need to wait a year the um when we're not funding an 80 million dollar middle school and there's that a big part of you know we asked for the track last year and we didn't get it i know so we're def we've already deferred it well yeah but it, we but but the reality is even last time now look at this year's ask but that's the problem is that we have asked for a lot of these projects. So let me take two steps back. It's that when the master facility plan was for, first put forward, and most of us here weren't on the board, I think only Kathleen was, um, they prioritized everything. They went through it. They said, these are the things that are the most important to us, which is ADA, school you know, safety, and I forgot what the third one was off the top of my head, air quality. And that is how all of these projects were prioritized. We have had We've been looking at Julian Curtis, Riverside, and Old Greenwich for I can't tell you how long. Yes, Central has had to jump forward in the timeline, but more than half of the stuff that we're looking at here is stuff that's been kicked down the road. The can't, and if we keep doing that, the costs are just going to escalate. I'm not saying we're kicking everything down the road. I'm saying we have to acknowledge that this is an extraordinarily unique budget year. But I think some of the projects you're talking about, I mean, not that I'm going to say they're sort of chump change, like the track at the high school. No, 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 I'm saying so. So chain reducing those I, is so de minimis. It doesn't mean it's not meaningful. Like, you know, I, I, I disagree that, you know, cutting all these little things really impacts our students um, and our buildings and defer. We've deferred a lot of maintenance and look where we are now on central and north. Main. Well, this, that's what some of these smaller projects are. If we defer some just Mr. Kelly. may I thank you. Since I've been on the board now for three years, if the priority of the project was a horse race, it would be in the lead. We have JC in second place. We have OG in third place. We have Central Middle School. Oh, no, Central Middle School makes a move around the outside. It moves to the first place. Second place goes Julie Curtis. Third place goes, oh, Greenwich. Oh, no, where's Riverside? Come bring it up the rear. Okay, what's happening then? If announced like, the, uh, like a horse race in the time here, we're getting criticized and I've seen this year after year where the money folks, the BET people are telling us, well, you guys can't get your priorities straight. We had nothing to do with North Miami school uh, ceiling collapsing and all of a sudden getting in front of the horse race. So that was now first. So then again, they look at us as we're trying to advance our projects saying, well, you guys can't get your order straight. 
And it seems like a way that they're deferring the responsibility of pushing off the projects on us. So I would suggest, and if it's Central Middle School seems to be the consensus right here, we make a clear statement that that is the priority for us to move forward on stuff. Own it. Don't let anything else step in the way. Own it, declare it, and say this is the priority. So nobody can then push on us the fact that we don't understand our own priorities. That's the reason why the ranking system might be an incorrect way of doing it, but we definitely have to put our priority together and stop the criticism from the outside saying we don't know what's first. And then you just drop what's in middle school in that sense. Is that what you're suggesting? Could you imagine that? Pardon? Say that so again. you're dropping Western middle school fields in that scenario? I didn't, I didn't make a priority, okay. but we have to make that priority and own those mm -hmm. priorities. Yes, Cody. I think you would, in, in a world where you said you have to underbuild Central or delay Western a year, I think you would build Central correctly and delay it. Now, you know how I feel about Western. I think all the parents should have pitchforks and be at these uh, bureaucrats' house, houses who are holding this up, burning them down. But um, so I'm not saying that I think that's the right thing, but I do agree with, uh, with Joe that... Um, the prioritizing, there's a intangible benefit to us by, um, and I actually think we did that. So I'm not like, like it was, I thought we had a very productive budget committee meeting where we said, okay, we know the central number is going up a lot. So what can we do to, um, uh, you know, change the uh, expected capital needs? And we did that. Uh, but I, I do agree that I think it's actually helpful to just say, hey, this is what you know, this is what matters the most and second most, third most, because if we don't, we can pretend that like it'll all get funded anyways, but usually it just then leaves our control and someone else will do it. So I think some of the, what we're talking about is semantic, but I think the, the general um, approach Joe's recommending makes sense. And I do think we already, our budget committee meeting, I thought was actually a really good meeting to what great members we have on the budget committee. Um, I think so, Cody, I think you bring up a, a good point just to before we get too far down this road, I think the prioritization in theory um, should be built in ideally into the capital plan and what like what we started to do with the budget committee where we were kind of doing that and and instead of leaving maybe numbers inaccurate or higher than you know like at 30 million versus the 15 that we went to it, it is a challenging exercise I've, I've done it before for internal purposes where a lot there like the bet there are some members that will ask for force ranked capital they want you to go through each year and and go through and go one two three four five six seven eight nine ten on that year's request and depending on how you're modeling, I mean, that can be challenging. That might work for some departments. For others, if you build a relatively accurate, you know, a 15-year plan that you can stand behind, that's your ranking. That's your force ranking. I mean, so you're sending the message by doing the things that we were talking about at the budget committee by prioritizing. At the budget committee, we even talked about things like Old Greenwich um, to, to do this. And we were, we were doing this exercise. And I think it's important for us to maybe even have that same conversation where, you know, are, are, do we, do you ask for both? And then if we agree on asking for both in the same year, um, we are saying that these are priority number one, they're in fiscal year 24. Um, I think it would be wise to try to maybe force rank it as an exercise. If you do that in, you know, as a board or something, but that ranking should be built into the 15 to the 15 year plan, because you really can't force rank, like you said, one, uh, it's almost impossible, you know, like on a plumbing, you can't really force rank plumbing also to, you can't force rank your whole capital because you can't force rank a toilet that's needed against uh, a playground against like a building. I mean, and, th those and, just and basically don't the stadium is a great example of, we said it's not a priority, right? We're like, let's let, we don't need new visitor bleachers. You know, Joe said they can last for 15 years after his sledgehammer test. Um, and we put the road out a couple of years. Yes. And frankly, I'd actually put it out a little further than you have it in here, to be honest. So I think like just in terms of prioritization, I think we've done a lot. I agree with Cody that, you know, it's not, it's just, I just don't think it's as easy as one, two, three, four. If we have too many, we have 15 buildings, you know? So I think it's really hard, you know, it's like choosing your children. <laughs> you know, different version of it, but, you know, it's hard, it, it's, it's hard to say that, you know, how, how are we to say central, 
I'm not saying we're saying it like Central deserves it or Old Greenwich deserves it more. I Other than we say, say they're both. You have to remember the fact that even if we ask for some of these funds, Central Middle School isn't close to getting rebuilt next year. You know, some of the other schools might be, and you're still asking for it because you have well, to. Well, because this to is the state, the state process also, which puts, a, you that's, know, so, the, so that we're point. asking for the money, but we don't even need the money for six months to a year. So it's a little right. perverse with these bigger, there, with these bigger projects. Earn, earning interest at least, but I but mean, it's, it's kind of, it, you know, that we're asking for it and then we know it's not going to be utilized I, I for six to 12 months. I just can't sit here idly by and stomach a discussion where we're talking about the needs of our schools maintenance wise for all 15 schools, have Meyer, you know, and whatever, and saying we should cut this, that, and the other thing just to rebuild a school that desperately needs it. These are things that we as a district know that we need to do. It's not necessarily that one takes priority over another. I mean, yes, certainly if you don't have a school facility to put children in, it's one thing, but taking away from other schools and the, the regular maintenance that they've been looking towards it's still school safety to have an appropriate fence. You don't want a student to be out on a school playground and then find out that it's falling apart and having a student that gets hurt because we push that maintenance off. I think that there's a, yes, it is an unusual year. Yes, we have central middle school and we've had that before. We had it, in, I mean, it wasn't a middle school, but New Lebanon was a pretty big deal uh, for many years in the discussion over that. Western has waited. My daughter's going to graduate from Greenwich High School, having been a Western student and having had never stepped foot on that field. My son did the same. It's, I can't even begin. And so these are, I, this budget, when you're looking at capital is two separate budgets. It's these big, large projects and these other smaller ones, and you can push them off, but we know we've been underfunding regular maintenance. It is safety. It is, it is all these other pieces that have to be put into place. And you can't put that off just because you have to rebuild another school. I'm and I sorry. Th if you have particular line items, you're, yeah, you, we can have a discussion about them. But but the, and then we can vote on them. And then if we whatever passes passes, and then it'll go before the BET and the RTM, and they'll have those same discussions on those. I think that's the way to approach it on, on the smaller yeah, things. Yeah, I think it's on worth the small it. things. I think it's worth it to talk about uh, maybe the couple major ones that just because we kind of need direction if we're going to go one way or the other as a team to get that ready for you for the 20th. Um, and then maybe we, we still go through kind of line by line on, an, on a number of them. But and, um, just yeah. in interest of time, I think it would be helpful to talk about the major ones so yep. that our team kind of knows which way to go. And the other good point is this is very different than operating because the selectmen actually really works on capital, whereas the operating is kind of straight to the BET. So the selectmen kind of will hold, hold away these things versus like Eastern Civic Center. Like that's the sort of decisions that aren't being made. So we're also sacrificing other aspects to the town if they sort of don't look at this on a pro forma basis, which I really think central is kind of a unique situation that should be considered. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think some of the direction we've received and hopefully this kind of sticks for this for central middle school is that we're going to do our part to send over a number that we feel like, you know, reflects the best information we have in fairness to the first selectmen. It's not like we're, you know, sending over 67 million and then letting them prioritize everything, knowing that it's going to be by the time, you know, I think we're doing the, I think we're doing our part to do the right thing on central middle school and, and that will go a long way. One last uh, comment on that, Karen, I think you're right in what you're saying about making sure that maintenance is uh, not put off. Uh, I'm sure what we can get from our uh, from Dan and, and uh, our maintenance that's mandatory versus maintenance that's not mandatory. So of course we'll put a category that we cannot put off, and we'll put a category that could be flexible. So I guess we could separate it that way to maybe bring. Yeah, but we do that every year, and that's how come we're in the bind we're in because every year we're like, well, let's just move this one down. If we do that every year, we're going to cut to the bone and then still have things taken back. I think. I think that's the problem. I and mean, you're looking at things and yes, Riverside re renovation is in for 150 next year, but we're not going to be looking to do that till further down. We, how long ago did we vote and approve on old Greenwich ed specs? We haven't even brought that back to the table to talk about a building, like a building committee has just been formed, but we haven't even gone to, to bat to look at RFPs. And so we know even if we're asking for this, it's not happening in the next year. We have to be able to move forward on these projects because otherwise they'll never happen. And I don't, I'm not just talking about the big ones. I'm talking about the, I mean, I have some questions on some of the smaller ones too. And yes, I'm sure there's some things here that can be adjusted or removed, but overall, I, I, this is such a pared down 
capital budget. I don't think I've ever seen something so small. And as you know, Blaze pointed out, what's without the large projects, it's only like the rest of it's thirteen percent. But it's, it's it's 121 million dollars. It's not pared down. It is the largest capital budget in the history. But, of but again, no, 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 no. Ignore. But here's back you to can't the point. Ignore it. It's money. No, 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 no. But you have to. You have to again look at what. There's the big projects and there's the maintenance. Yeah. The maintenance is under 13 million, and that also includes a million three for disaster recovery and some other stuff. So here's my concern, Joe, that I about when you start talking about things that are mandatory and kind of like maybes, that's just given we're we're just handing it to the BET on a silver platter and the RTM to say we don't really need these things. That's not our job. They can they can do their due diligence. I think we do our due diligence to say what we vote on and what we believe. And that's why we have these discussions and we go through the CIP sheets and if we and we vote the way we vote. And once we vote it, it goes to them and let them make decisions. But if we start playing with, well, this is kind of optional, then let's us vote on it if we don't agree on it and see where the vote shakes out. But that's, I, you know, that's, what, that's our job. It's not to hand to them and say, well, this is our mandatories and these are our maybes. That's not, that's not the way the but process But just because works. we're building central doesn't mean I don't think we should do plumbing and electrical at other schools. Just this kind no, of a point. So, so, I think, right. so we no, go through them. It's a straw man argument about the like mandatory. No, one, everyone wants to do mandatory maintenance, but I, we, that doesn't mean we can't say, hey, is, is there anything in the list? Maybe the answer is But no. that's our yeah. discussion. Yeah, I agree. No, we right. Don't we don't, we're not foisting that on someone Let's else. We should. Tonight. <laughs> you know what? So, well, we have to do it tonight or on the 20th. <laughs> one last comment on that. Just directly addressing your comment, Christina. The, uh, and I hate to do this because in the real world, I don't do this, but sort of in this world of different agencies control different things. Uh, when it comes to doing stuff that has to be done, it has to be done. When the stuff that doesn't have to be done and it's no longer our responsibility to do it, we've passed it off to somebody else. Well, we could say that the reason why it's not done is not because of us, because of somebody else. And unfortunately, that's the way the, the machine works, where they're going to have to make some decisions. If we leave it to them to make a decision, and a mandatory thing has the same urgency as a non-mandatory thing, then the decision's theirs, and they could make the wrong one. And that's the worrying I have. If somebody says, why isn't the playground built? Because I believe someone brought up playground as a reference before. Why isn't the playground built somewhere? Well, because we didn't get the money for it. And it's no longer our responsibility. We requested it. It's It's... Uh, it's not what I do in the real world, but it sort of seems like this is the way it's done here. So, so why don't we, uh, I, think, I think we're good at Central Middle School uh, at the moment. We'll go with that approach. Blaze, you're getting points for being diplomatic. Uh, so how about, uh, so Julian Curtis, um, I think this is the one that we really want direction on. We talked about it for a long time at the budget committee. I mean, maybe some of the members want to give some thoughts on on kind of how we derived here, but um, the thought process here was was after um, a lot of input, thought, community conversation, budget discussions last year um, to come up to take the existing ed specs, uh, prioritize those, and we we basically put together the package um, that's before you with a little bit of adjustments after the budget committee meeting with some input. Uh, the thought process here, as I mentioned, is the eight hundred thousand for the accessible front entrance. 50,000 to start the design early uh, to get that going, then roll right into the cafeteria. Um, it, it, there's a clear need. I mean, it's only a thousand square feet. It's extremely small uh, compared to any other school. Um, that was the one that the principal said was, was if you're gonna do anything other than ADA, do this one. Um, to, to your point, actually, what we were talking about doing, um, do this. Um, and then going through and, 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 you know, old sinks that are that are decades old and, and things like that, that Dan has identified and Dr. Jones actually gets out and walks through a lot of the buildings and mill work that needs to be upgraded um, and, and kind of putting together a package to balance the needs of, the, of, of financing and prioritization and sending a message, um, but also still investing in the in the school. And, so. I, and I think all of us on the budget committee, you know, while we you know, I think we all feel this is an appropriate compromise that you know gets the building and accessible it, it you know in a perfect world yes we would have done a full renovation but i think we've we've asked for this money twice i'm not sure the appetite is there for the rest of the town so let's be realistic um and do the things that need absolutely need to be done um it, to joe's point 
this doesn't foreclose us from coming back at some point down the road. And as long as the money is spent wisely and Joe will be on the building committee, so I'm sure it will be. Um, I, I think that was, uh, you guys can correct me. I think that was kind of the mood of the room, which is why we directed Plays and Tony to, to make this revision and cut 30 million or whatever it was off next year's number, but it came 20 something. Yeah, off, it was off uh, next it's year. 29 point, it was 1.5 this year for the A and E uh, and 29.7 next year. That's so trying to balance Laura Costin has a question. Sorry, she texts me now because I can't see her. Go ahead, Laura. Hey, I just, you know, we didn't address the science room at JC either because this project seems to be kind of chopped up now and very piecemealed and very unfortunate, but in the interest of educational equity, I would like to sort of understand why there's no money for a science room when other schools have a science, have science rooms. And, you know, if, if we, as I mentioned, are even gonna think about universal pre-K in a Title I school, it would make sense that we have preschool classrooms in that Title I school. So I, I'm just, I'm a little disappointed by, you know, what I'm hearing. And because it really does seem like um, we're losing sight of a greater need. And I want to just be very transparent about my feelings about that. Well, I mean, I actually have a question and then a comment in regards to JC since, since that's where we're at. I've just, much like Laura, I'm very disappointed, honestly. Um, I, I understand that we are struggling to move forward, but one of the things we've spent so much time talking about sitting in this boardroom, uh, even before I was on this board, is not pitting one school against another. We created that 15-year master facility plan so that schools and, and those communities would have an understanding of where they fell in line when it came to renovations and you know and things happening within their schools, it, it hasn't moved forward the way we had been, you know, we had promised the community that it would. And you know, now we're at a, sitting here having a discussion where you're kind of pitting one school against another, one school's needs and one community's needs against another. And my level of disappointment at this moment is significant. And I rarely get this emotional about something about it at a meeting, but I sat in meetings during FERB and watched schools being pit against school, and it was not a good place to be. I don't want to get there again, and I feel like that's where we're heading. I'm very disappointed, I just have to say. I do understand having to make some decisions because we need to get things funded and move forward, but I, I feel like that's where we're heading, and it's, it's very disappointing for me. Um, so that being said, when it comes to Julian Curtis, you know, again, yes, I agree. We need universal pre-K was something we, we have the need for uh, classroom, you know, additional classrooms for that anyway. But my bigger question is one of the things we've been talk, we've been told time and time again is once you start to work on a facility for adding ADA compliance, you are required to do all of it. You can't do it piecemeal. So is where do we put ourselves if we put in an, an elevator and can't get to do the renovation work to make sure every single doorway in that facility is wide enough for a wheelchair or every single doorknob is at the appropriate level or sink is at the appropriate level for someone with ADA needs. Where are we if we are not revising the, the entryway to allow students to access the building to get to an elevator wherever that may be or families that are coming into that school facility? Do we put ourselves at risk for legal action if we're not going to be doing the whole, you know, all of the ADA, a ADA improvements at once? Yeah, I, I, I'll try to answer your question. I, I'm not quite sure where you got the language that once you start, you have to finish it. Um, we have a, I want to say a systematic plan where we're going to move forward and do ADA in pieces across the district. I think, uh, we had several discussions in the last couple of years about the actual cost it would be to renovate every school in the district to compliancy. And it's, uh, it's a very large number. So as far as what we're doing at JC, 
we are starting from the outside. It doesn't make sense to renovate a bathroom if you can't get a person with mobility issues into the building. So that's why we started from the outside. Uh, the issue of, of putting the elevator, that was a emphasis when we were um, provided the money by the town, the emphasis for ADA would be for an elevator. So that's where, that's where we're at with that. And you're probably looking at a cost for an elevator somewhere around a million dollars. We got 1.1 million. So the question of whether or not we're gonna be able to do bathrooms with the allotted money, you're not gonna do a bathroom or multiple bathrooms for $100,000. So it's, it's a matter of financing it. So we can let them access the students that have needs or families that have needs, they'll be able to access the building, but God forbid they have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the day. So I, I, I understand the, the, the point we have, we can't do everything all at once, but to me, it just, if you're going to be doing some of it, I mean, we were, this was a discussion from a long time ago, maybe that's where I understood it, that, and I won't say the term grandfathered in, but you know, we weren't being, you know, once you start to do major renovation work on a building for things, you have to bring it fully up to code. That was what I had always been, it had explained to us in previous meetings, years upon years. So I, I maybe I misunderstood, but you know, if we're gonna be doing it, then we do really need to consider you're giving access to students to the building if they need it. We need to make sure that they have access to facilities that, you know, to, to meet their other needs. Um, so, you know, I don't see bathrooms on here. It doesn't have to be every bathroom, but I do think that you have to make sure that they can access different, you know, pieces as well during the school day. We, we do have, just as a point of clarity, we do have, uh, to Dan's point, the bathrooms are also built into the ADA program. So, there, there could be some balancing between being included in this project, what's on our, you know, what's on us is to coordinate the requests in other years for other programs with other projects. So like the ADA compliance program that Dan has um, and that the board has been, uh, you know, investing in every year um, does include those those strategies so that's a good point that we should revisit to ensure that we're prioritizing lining them up one with of the, the adjustments and projects why ada compliance was so low this year like funding wise it was 249 versus over a million for years going forward and i was you know wondering because we also had to do some stuff here right with fire escapes and and, and other things right the fire escapes aren't ada no, they're not. Okay. No. They're funded under so I just budget. didn't see that located anywhere in the budget. I know it's the money was already given to us, but I didn't see it reflected here anywhere. The and fire escapes. Moved, yeah. Because we got the funding. Yes, but you have things here listed for prior three years. I didn't see any it, anywhere. Uh, That's the pri why, so I was just the prior three went. years is is what is what they require on the form is whenever you're requesting a project for that specific project, you have to include the total that was budgeted for that project. Well, that explains that part. Thank you. That's that um, and just so you know, Karen, in the worksheet on the CIP sheet, as part of the 249 of the ADA compliance, it's 204,000 for Julian Curtis. The, the point is to of coordinate. The two, of the ADA you know, compliance, no, I, the I line that, share is going to JC. Specific as to what, where that was going. So that's why I was just trying to figure that out. That was my next it's on question. page seven. No, 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 no. It doesn't. I, I was that was going to be my next question, which was that. Just a comment, quick one, Karen. I support you in your uh, JC project. I've been the advocate for JC for some time now. Uh, I, we tried very hard. Sometimes you just have to change direction if you're just not getting where you have to go. And I'm, I'm not sure we're there. We can continue to fight a little bit more. We can certainly talk about it. But those kids need to be brought up in an elevator. Those kids need bathrooms that are compliant. Those kids need stuff immediately. We can just keep, keep how many more years are we going to get pushed off on this? Oh, no, I agree with you yeah, on that. So I, I'm not necessarily I'm saying what I'm we're torn. doing. I, I agree yeah. with you, but I'm yeah. torn. So I'm not saying I agree with moving forward in a partial way. I try to make sure that the money we're investing in it in a discussion with Dan just now was money that could build on some sort of the renovations that we've always talked about, but I'm torn. Mm -hmm. it, it just, they need something and, and whatever we're doing yes. is not working. I understand the theory of not cutting off your nose despite your face, right? Be and, and that's where we're at in this point. They, they need what they need, but it, I was talking about something that just went 
further than that. It wasn't just JC. We're sitting here talking about which project is more important and that we're talking about some large projects and it is, it's not just JC. Now we're, we're pitting, you know, we have OG coming behind. Suddenly is it OG not gonna be as important? You know, they have classrooms that were flooding. We, we, we approved those ed specs so long ago, but now that Central's here, it so, will be so costly. Suddenly that OG gets pushed. By. So that's why I was saying it's not just JC. And I understand that we have to, we, we don't have unlimited funds and we have to make decisions that are in the best interest of all of our residents as well as our students and, and you know, educational community. But uh, just, I'm just, I'm at a point of, of absolute, I, I, I don't even have words, which is for me pretty rare. So to, to balance some of the, uh, you know, cause there was a lot of discussion about JC on, at, the, at the committee meeting. I mean, it is a 15 year plan for, for signaling to some of the things we can talk about is, uh, I mean, we're looking all the way through in theory, at least 2038. Um, we can still put some renovation money in farther out years um, and years where we talk about smoothing out the bumps. Uh, some of these years are significantly low um, because they're so far out that it's kind of unreasonable to be really thinking about some realistic things. But this is a major renovation, so I think you don't have to totally take you know, you know, it's something you can talk about is, is to kind of balance because you had some of these concerns the other the other day. Um, and how can you still keep some of it on the radar so that a building committee knows that because there is a building committee already established. Um, and, and it's kind of the model that's unfortunately or fortunately already being moved forward. Um, so you can still put some money in the out years for maybe some renovation that signals to the building committee that whatever they're designing should be something that can be leveraged in 10 to 12 years um, for potentially a, another renovation, depending on enrollment. Yeah, that would be JC's 100 year anniversary then. So that'd be cool. There's something that, that can still be talked about um, to find common ground on that one so that we still keep it on the radar, uh, but we prioritize for the next five getting, getting something done for them. So that, that's something that you can think about. Yeah, I do just want to point out too that I, I think walking through the building was really important just as that refresher because they do have several bathrooms in that building that were rebuilt, Trish thinks, around 2009. They're actually nice. There's some that are super old. Um, so there are parts of the building. Their terrazzo floors are still beautiful. They're not like at OG where they have like the yellow caution tape where it was cracking. Um, so they're I think we've tried to be really thoughtful about what what's in here and the secure entryway is, you know, is important. But again, that in the plan, you can see where they had the ramps coming off the side that would get taken care of really quickly. And that plus the elevator that's already been funded. Um, I think they're, they're really important projects and the cafeteria alone, again, it really does impact instruction. And I was saying um, when we have like an early release day, we want kids to be able to have a hot lunch. Um, you know, at JC, they were asking if we were just gonna stay with the sack lunches like we did during COVID because they can't fit all their kids in the cafeteria. And so, you know, it's hard for them on days like that to even get kids through hot lunch. So by the cafeteria can also partnership with other pieces of the building. They might put that cafeteria where there are an existing classrooms right now and then take the cafeteria and create wonderful small spaces by putting up walls so you know I think that's the idea of having a building committee and still listening and being responsive to what they're asking for so we're hopeful because again I mean it's it, this is a five-year plan and we haven't been able to move anything yet and right now we've had five years of kids moving through the building and they didn't have an elevator they didn't have any of it so we're trying to, I guess, bring a realistic point of view, trying to help the building um, get something done. That's important. So, so that's JC. I think, uh, you know, we can mull over the point if we want to add any money in the, you know, in a decade um, for signaling, but that's something we can kind of think about as a team. A any other things that at the moment uh, we want to talk about on JC or move to the next major one, which would be Riverside? Um, and that would be a, a 
similar uh, thought process here, uh, still a little bit different, but um, it's kind of hard. We have less information uh, for Riverside than we have for Julian Curtis. Um, so that's one of the challenges with this one. Um, 150,000 in fiscal year 24 to get a team together, uh, to study the building, look at the structure and the needs of the facility. Um, and then uh, 1.5 million as a placeholder, it's kind of hard to know. Uh, again, because we don't know exactly what that 150 will look like, but uh, 1.5 million for A and E, and then uh, 15 million um, in. I have it in 29, but we could look at 28 uh, to kind of line up a little bit better. To Christina's point, that's something we could talk about um, to still signal to to what type of work and tolerance that we want to balance. Uh, it's a little harder because we don't have the uh, ed specs like we did for Julian Curtis to look at and prioritize with the team. Um, but that's the thought process there. And just, you know, we did take it down. It was it previously in for 31 million, I think. It was 31.65 million. And I uh, think the group at the budget committee really felt like if we're kind of going back to kind of more basic needs, uh, but, but, but again, because we don't have a feasibility study, we couldn't cut it so low. But to the cafeteria point, as I look at the sheet, from Blaze and that Riverside has a 1700 square foot cafeteria with almost 500 kids in the building, you know, that that clearly is going to be an issue for them. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's things like that, the, those things that we just don't, we haven't really looked Did, at. Didn't but, we do a whole review of all the cafeterias in the district a year, a couple of years ago, looking at the no sizes in comparison to school? I'm pretty sure we did. I can go back and look and well, we have this at least in terms of this is just square. So is that what that comes from? This okay. is from that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So I know we, I was gonna say, I know we have more data than that at some point. That was pulled out of that. Um, yeah, you know, kind of tells the message. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> uh, So, so I don't know if we have any thought. I mean, I know it's getting pretty late here. Uh, he had the curriculum to go through first before capital, but that that's kind of the thought on Riverside. Um, I think going it's a once, fairly going dependable twice. approach. Uh, it is no, what I it is. Kind of agree kinda. with you moving it up a year though, just because it seems to. It's, it's too, a it's too big a gap with the state reimbursement process because the state reimbursement put that would be the kind of thing that will push it out a year. So I think I'd move that to the 27, 28. But frankly, it's a little hard to judge because you just picked a random number and cut it in half from what I can tell. So Well, no, no, but I'm just more about timeline. Right. You know, we typically do A&E, then we take a year and then we do construction money is usually is our typical, you know, obviously, you know, things have not been the, typical. The thought there too, the name of the project, that's why it's highlighted was Riverside Expansion Renovation. And that was what was kind of built into the 31.65. So here we were signaling a major renovation potentially, um, but took out the word expansion. And, and that's, it's still, yeah, I mean, it's still kind of pulling a number out. We figured but, cutting it in but half. That was, the there is some thought like behind it. And, and cutting the number in half was kind of like right, so as good the, a guess as any. It, it's not expansion half, renovation. Yeah, that's yeah. What, that yeah. was the thought there, okay, you know. Um, and until we have a, a, a more detailed study like we had for JC, it's kind of hard to go through and pick those key projects. Okay, that's Riverside. <laughs> uh, Cardinal. I think this is the other one we really need some direction on because we don't have a project sheet for this one yet. Um, and it, it does require some fiscal year 24 appropriation. Um, we originally, you know, in the budget was showing the 6 million. We talked about eliminating uh, part of the phase two um, because it's in good shape and, and the needs, uh, delaying the road to see where we're at. We can talk about where that should be. I would um, push it out. A couple more years, personally. Yep. I don't. I don't think it's two years away. I think it's probably longer. Because to Joe's point, once we didn't get anything done before the state road project, I don't. The, the, you know, the people at the high school there may argue otherwise, but the same level of urgency. And again, back to priorities: the four million dollars versus four million dollars at one of our other buildings. It requires the bridge, um, and you know. As, as Dan has alluded to and has already talked to DPW about it, it's expensive um, to do. Um, no, but I'm saying push it out. Yes. Yeah, no matter what, though, I think we do need to make the request 
uh, for the trees. Uh, to close out the project, it looks like, I mean, that was mostly supposed to be in phase two. Uh, Dan, Dr. Jones, and I have been working really closely. Uh, Joe, I know you've been involved in trying to wrap up the project, go through the financials. Uh, we're in pretty good shape. Um, it's really just the trees and the planting. We, we needed to get the CO. Um, you know, I am, I did, I did used to work in parks. I'm going to talk to the tree warden to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, you know, what we need is really what we need. Um, so I will do that before the 20th uh, on that number. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm not going to bring Joe to the meeting. Uh, might go to that one by myself. Uh, but on that topic, just one comment. Yes. The question is to Dan. Uh, do we, in order to, we've done a lot of work on the bridge on the road. Uh, I would like to somehow, if we're going to mothball the project to preserve the work we've done so far and make sure we don't have to redo that work, do we have to invest anything to make sure that we preserve the point we're at right now so then in the future, we don't have to go backwards to readdress anything? Is there any money we have to spend to do that? Or can we mothball it without having to readdress anything we've already done because we've done a lot of work? I think we're in good shape. I mean, we stopped at a logical at a logical point. If we had gone any further, we would have to take out the, the tennis courts and things like that. So we stopped at a logical point and phase two would have picked up from there. So I don't think there's anything that needs to be done. Um, um, I, I'll go back and look at the phase two drawings to see if there was any required trees other than what the tree warden had requested. But I think it's just the trees from phase one that we need to that we need to add. Good, so we could pick up sometime in the future and not have wasted all the work we've done and use that as a starting point rather than having to go back. We're good with that. Right, I mean, we still do not have um, buildable drawings for phase two. We, you know, that, that, that we would have to start at that point. We have, you know, I think DD level drawings at best. You know. But that we can preserve what we've done to make sure we don't have to start from the beginning again. Correct. Good, perfect. Just a quick question about trees, since we're talking about trees. Um, has the Tree Conservancy or any other outside groups offered to help with the cost of the trees? Just at a, because I know we we've talked about it park? a little bit with the high school entryway landscape. I, I was just, I didn't know if anyone had been in touch with them to see if they'd donate some trees to help with the cost. Well, it's a good question. I think, Dan, can you better answer I, that one? Because I have not. It seems like they, they are uh, hand in hand. I know you love private money. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's their hand in hand with the tree ward. And they want us, they feel we've got obligations to fulfill uh, based off some, they keep making reference to some obligations which we didn't fulfill in the past, the previous Board of Education. So I don't think they're willing to cooperate as much as they would if we had done the other obligations, which we did not fulfill. Which we don't know what they were since we haven't previous done them. Board, previous yeah. board. No, no, I'm saying I don't think anybody knows. I, I think if I do talk to the to the tree warden, which I will do before the 20th, um, I will also ask this question though, uh, just having been in parks and work with the Tree Conservancy quite a bit. We do have the property, we are gonna be doing the work. So if we can offer to leverage something there for their own interest for in, in exchange for private uh, funding. There may be uh, like the species, uh, you know, if we could add in a pawpaw grove or something, um, there may be some exchange that we can do there. <laughs> I've heard, I've learned more in the last two and a half years about pawpaws than you would think of. So they are native to Connecticut and we this are planting This is a discussion for a different day, but now I want to hear what a yes, pawpaw grove is. Yes. Um, I, I would ask for some guidance. It doesn't have to be today, but we will want guidance on, on where that four million should sit. So uh, I know I'd we're go, talking I'd about go, pushing it out. We're but talking I, about I would go out a year or two. Do you want to take that past the, I, the five year well, mark? Well, I, I have trade that for Riverside. Well, I have a question for this Bring year's for, for not four years down the road for for this year's ask but on the stadium. Mm -hmm. Go for it. So having a been at the stadium for a night game which is pretty rare um it went late you know the lights need to get turned off at a certain point and granted we didn't have a huge uh out, a turnout for the uh, field hockey senior night because it was torrential downpours um but it is pitch black in there pitch black and so i know part of the initial discussion of phase two when we were going to do the bleachers 
there was a discussion, I think at some point, just like a, some pathway lighting that's not there. And there, it's dangerous if they're having students. Uh, we have two night games coming up, I think, for football, right, Joe? Yeah. Uh, so I was going to ask if anybody has thought which, about- Which pathway are you talking so about? So when you go back behind the second uh, set of bleacher, you know, the visitor bleachers, right. that pathway over the little bridge there past the baseball field, because that's how the students go back to the school. Um, and all, part of the program, you know, okay, well, so okay. Whatever it might be, maybe it might've been uh, a, a bullet point to discuss for phase two, but whatever it is, uh, having been back there, you know, most people park in the general parking lot. It's really dangerous, uh, especially when it's wet because there's a lot of gravel. Well, the um, other thing just is, saying. just so you know, you, I'm agreeing with you. I, I don't know why that path wasn't included, but the lighting that used to reside on the on the western side of the parking lot, all the way along fields three and four, that lighting was taken out as part of the uh, soil abatement. So that would have provided some light, certainly not enough, but behind, you're talking about the, the you're talking about the path that leads by the baseball. Field. Yeah, so if you go back behind the visitor bleachers, which is where the majority of our students will come in and out, and especially after a night game, because most people, again, park in our main parking lot, not the little side parking lot, um, that's how they exit the stadium. Uh, a lot of people will walk back through this, that, and it's that's very dark. A, that's a great suggestion. Yep. Should I work offline with Dan and just have a conversation with that? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what it would cost, and it, you know, I was like, I'll go over to Costco and buy the little solar I'll lights take, you just stick in the ground. But yeah, I'll take you, I'll work with you. But I just figured it, it, there, you know, it's not a lot of light. It's not an ambient light. We'll, it can we'll be turned on, but yeah. There may be funding uh, already. It's just a safety issue. No, that makes sense. The only thing I would be worried about is I'm not sure how that area is affected by the soil remediation project. I wouldn't want to put in something and have it ripped out, but I can talk to the town about that. Yeah, I, again, I mean, I, I, I'm one. not sure. I'm sure there's other alternatives, whether it's just that they have lighting that they can put in so, and remove for the night games, or if it's just those little, you put little stakes in the ground, that, whatever it might be, that remote control, whatever it might be. I just noticed having walked through that in the dark and the kids were trying to carry all of their sports equipment. It was, it was dangerous. That's a good one. Yeah. Okay. So we'll put the 4 million in 29 and we'll explore the lighting and I will talk to the tree warden. No promises. So I'm, I'd like to set the bar pretty low and then maybe, uh, I think for major projects that might've been it, except, uh, did we want to, uh, we did actually about an hour before this meeting, the kitchen. Um, I think we might actually, I just, I'm looking at my last little bit of hand notes. We may also want to talk about the GHS kitchen project. Um, the dishwasher, I mean, um, we have it in for 250,000. Um, what line item is it or CIP sheet? Uh, so 250,000, um, the initial design estimate that um, Dan just got uh, literally at the end of the day today um, is closer to 400,000. Um, so, and, and we still need the trays and other things to implement that project. That does not include the like steel, stainless steel trays and all that. This is just the construction that has to happen, the dishwasher itself. Um, the work, you know, electric, everything we need to do to put in a dishwasher for the high school. The, the equipment is, is yeah, not a, a, that expensive. Uh, it's really the construction work to put that room together uh, and move the dishwasher room and, and move the facilities room. Um, that's the most expensive piece that's driving the cost. We have for this project um, 250000 in the GHS kitchen renovation. And in plumbing, um, there is some overlap. In plumbing and electrical, there is a, a request for the high school. A portion of that is for GHS, and it is for this kitchen. It's not in this project specifically because Dan's team has noticed that this is work that's going to have to happen anyways to the plumbing and electrical there. So that, fit, But it would be the same overlapping work that would happen if you were going to do the dishwashing work. Um, but no matter what, they've noticed some of that plumbing really needs some work. 
Um, I, I don't know, Dan, if you want to add anything to that piece. I mean, I know we just got the, we literally just got it like, right think before this meeting, one? but it's just something yeah. that should get on the radar now since we only have until October 20th. One of the things, things I'd want to, I guess, I mean, of course, for sustainability, there's an argument for it. Um, but is there a trade-off in terms of the annual cost that must be associated with disposable trays, right? So keep in mind that... <laughs> Well, you know, I, the sustainability is a very different discussion than cost because we're going to need two people, additional staff in order to make this work. Is this just for sustainability or is there an actual need for this? This, this is really to move away from right now we have like biodegradable for the most part trays. Um, this moves to like a stainless steel, I think it is Anne, yeah. And um, so that we're washing actually the dishes um, and you don't have the- Single use. Uh, yeah, you, you don't, you're not throwing away your trays every day at the high school. And we started with the high school, which is one of the largest, you know, buildings. So it would be almost a third of the district would be moving in this direction, but it, there's a cost to doing it and we have to have the staff and it will be two additional people. There's no cost savings really. Well, I mean, it's, well, it's, 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 there is, but it's not gonna be significantly close to just the operating expense to Dr. Jones's point. I mean, two staff. I mean, right, right nice, now we're not washing the dishes. So there's would a it be a full-time over... staff? I mean, to, to do that for that particular position? I'm just wondering, cause I know the cost to purchase the trays and then to just the, the, the cost to dispose it. We, the, there was a whole research done on the cost of purchasing and disposing trays. There was a huge, yeah. So I just didn't know if somebody, if you hire somebody like that, do they need to be a full-time position? 0.7. I'm just talking about the time. You're head. joking, right? Okay. No, I, mean, I, I didn't necessarily have need an answer. I was just curious. It's, uh, I mean, we just got, I mean, unfortunately to, I mean, literally, at the end of the day today, Dan just got the uh, the numbers at, at that's closer to four hundred thousand. We kind of already knew we were going to be around three hundred thousand. We're putting together the operating budget. We're still thinking about headcount, but to Dr. Jones's point, we know there is going to be some headcount impact. Uh, whether it's two full time people, whether it's two part time people, we're, we're still in discussion about. But no matter what, there's there's headcount impact. Um, it's so, all single use trays right now. So um I I know the, the page can't have it, but I would recommend putting this on a column about 10 inches to the right of the end of this page. It's, got two years left here, it's probably 2070. Yeah. We gotta get one of the map plotter ones that we had on the other day. Uh so it's a conversation. I mean, do we want to, you know, it, it's a really intense conversation. I mean, we don't have to uh I think we don't have to, there are people who have already reached out to the office um, asking about the status of this request, you know, just to be very clear. Um, so I, I think- Tell it's them a, to call Cody. Uh, I think we'll tell them to call Cody and uh, that'll be fine. Uh, no, but I think it's just, it's something that the board should talk about before the 20th. I'd say, I would argue that that is one of, there are, there are lines here. The, um, I know it's unpopular, but there are lines here like that, that that don't fall in the maintenance requests that are small that I think don't can't be we really can't prioritize this year given everything else. I think this is one of them. They, I'm, I'm all for sustainability. This isn't the year to do it to do it. I mean it's just not. It's not the year to renovate the stage. There's nothing sustainable it's not about wasting money. Right. I think there's there's probably five or six lines that we I think the, could think about. Is could we do would there be possible to just give us like an email with a quick analysis of yeah. custom install staffing costs. Yeah, we, we just got cost the of what we spend on the trays. I think that would yep. just be helpful yep. to the board. We will share that via email for conversation before, and then and then that can also be posted on board docs because I know you know, a lot of people will be interested in, in it. So we can do that. It's not a secret. Uh, we'll we'll share it with the board in advance, and. It'll, it will make sure that we have it on the agenda to talk about on the 20th. Um, well, we can also have another budget committee meeting that might before be the 20th good, yeah. might be productive once right. we kind of hone through a lot of these things. I know, you know, and, and we just love getting together on the budget committee. Yeah. So, you know, we, we had a great time. I mean, so, it was a very yeah. productive we'll meeting. We'll bring snacks say, next so. time. You know, uh, 
operating um, is yeah, yeah I'm really uh I'm let's to get through the 20th in the capital <laughs> before we start jumping to the operating well, um, yeah. Can we talk about my suggestion on the high school security project? Not that I want to be adding things, but I would like to hear people's thoughts on my idea. If Which people was, prefer to just wait it out and go. That was like six or, hours ago. What was your idea again? Adding 200,000. Oh, I said 275. I was like going around the 10% number, figuring that was like a good, it's as good a number as I could come up with. If, if there's a general view that that's a good idea, we can ask Blaze to include it. I think it's thoughtful argument that we already spent it i mean well no 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 because well well we basically spent our all right. right or we're saying it to now but but again before the budget actually gets voted on we'll know what the number is so we're basically putting this is a true placeholder because we'll know before the bet even votes so where on this because i didn't even it's an add-on it's an add-on okay, okay. yes so we would be adding Two seventy five. Uh, at least for discussion, for, we should have on here uh, two hundred seventy five thousand as additional funds for the GHS entryway project in next year, one time. I'd rather ask for more and be able to. Well, return. I guess that no, no, no. I'd rather. No, I'm, I'm supporting no. your saying. I, I would rather ask for more because we know we needed to do this and be able to return if we don't use it. Than to start a project. Well, it'll, it, you know what? To be it. honest, it'll just get cut before the budget gets voted on. It wouldn't even have to be returned because we're going to vote on it. It's going to go. The BET doesn't vote till the end of March. And if the timeline for the project stays as is, that project's out to bid by then, or maybe, maybe not by then, but it'll be out to bid. But it'll be before the RTM votes in May. We would be. We would know with certainty. So it's up to the group about the number. I just made up that number. So, and it's preferable to an interim, I think, for you know, based on the timing. So, and it's preferable uh, selfishly, definitely to an interim. Okay, so that's all the major stuff I had. Um, open to other questions. We can also take questions via email um, and put together. For some, most of the other stuff is some smaller dollar amounts, but not less significant. I think if we want to take questions via email, we can also put together a Q&A, something we could work on with the budget committee in advance Should and circulate we, it to yeah, the team. Yeah, I was going to say we could do the Google Doc like we've done in the past, sort of share that around. Um, the only other thing I wanted to point out is the GHS cellular improvement project. I am all in on this, having tried to reach my child today. I can tell you it does not work, and uh, it's a real safety issue. So. And Mike, uh, Mike is reaching out again. He did it last year. We talked earlier. He is going to once again reach out to the major cell carriers. And based on the volume we have there, see if there's any assistance that can be provided in funding or equipment, things like that. So he's working on that now. And we'll have that before the 20th if, they, if any of these major carriers think there's anything they can do to help us out. He did reach out last year. It didn't, it didn't work, but we'll try again. So just a quick question since... The next time we get this back is the only time people are going to have the opportunity. We're going to have the opportunity to hear from the public on this. I know we talked about this at the very start, but again, I know you're going to push it out in your weekly notice, but I think it's you know important for all of us to make sure that people are aware that the next time this comes before us, we're voting on it. So now is the time for the community to share their thoughts with us, even ahead of uh, public comment at that meeting. Maybe the PTA, Laura, you're, you're the liaison to PTA council. They should be pushing this out as well, don't you think? I mean, I think so. I will make that suggestion because it is so bad. And what version, I think, like for, if we're going to send out too, I think we make the change on the 4 million, we move Riverside to make the change. And that's the one, I mean, after your comments oh. tonight is probably... I wouldn't post another version until after like the budget committee maybe meets yeah. on it, right? We have it on the on board docs. It, this is version on board push docs out. already. The question so to push out is just to comment that if no, we're they pushing, look push at this and share to tell people to give us comments. Yep. So I would hold off on this till we meet again. Can I ask just Makes one more question? Yeah. Um, the roofs on um, for the guy that's like is that plural? Oops. Um, North Mianus in 24 25 i know it's not this budget cycle but the next one 2.3 million i mean i have to ask the question didn't we just fix something just the ceilings we didn't get to the roof it was just the ceilings okay 
So that, that money is basically going towards the gym roof, which hasn't been addressed in a while, and there may be some abatement issues. That's why the numbers are up. Thank you. Ann? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Want to make, give me a motion? Just one, yeah. I have one advertisement. The um, strategic planning committee <laughs> meets on Monday. The, um, any comments, we'll be reviewing board comments. So if any board members have comments, we appreciate on the draft, we'd appreciate them before Monday's Columbus Day meeting. No offense, it takes no priority to the budget committee. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Can I get a second? Okay. All in favor? And Ms. Costin? Yes. Okay. 7 0. Thank you so much. Good night.